What's going on there, YouTube? And welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, guys, so we are going to do a full story video. A full story video is when I sit down, take a bunch of videos that tell one overarching storyline and combine them together into one big video. Now, with that being said, today's full story video is going to be about the Secret Warriors. The Secret Warriors was a team made by Nick Fury out of Secret Invasion because Nick Fury was on the run after Secret Wars because the man did break a few laws but he still wanted to protect the world and so of course he made the Secret Warriors team a secret team to be used to protect the world now when it came to the Secret Warriors storyline well Nick Fury found out that in reality he never did run S.H.I.E.L.D. that in reality S.H.I.E.L.D. was being controlled secretly by Hydra and so of course Nick Fury this entire time was actually working for Hydra and so the entire Secret Warrior series is really more of Nick Fury getting revenge on Hydra and trying to bring down Hydra but also another shadow group out there as well that technically wants to get rid of Nick Fury but also Hydra as well and take over the earth and so here is the Secret Warrior storyline is six different videos combined all together into one big video. And the reason why, because after Secret War, yes, Secret War, not Secret Wars, with an S at the end of it, Secret War. It was a mini series that Marvel did back in like the early 2000s. It was a way to kind of remove Nick Fury from S.H.I.E.L.D. and give Iron Man, Maria Hill, and other characters the chance to actually leave S.H.I.E.L.D. in future books after Secret War. But of course, at the end of Secret War, you had Nick Fury just disappear. He's all like, listen guys, I'm done playing on politics. You will never see me or hear from me ever again. I'm out of here by later. And of course, he disappeared. And so the scrolls and the heroes are trying to figure out where in the world did Nick Fury go? Because for the scrolls, if Nick Fury is still around, he can basically ruin their entire plan. But then we actually do pick up with Nick Fury. Now, you do have Nick Fury one month later after Secret War go undercover, where of course he's hiding out from all the heroes and anybody else who's basically looking for him, like S.H.I.E.L.D., because he broke so many laws in Secret War that of course he is the most wanted man in the world. Now, with that being said, though, he's right now hiding out in some random country wearing one of the worst disguise he could ever wear. Because honestly, his disguise is just him, but bald. That's it. Like literally, you should be able to walk out and be like, oh yeah, that's Nick Fury. Anyways though, you do have Nick Fury right now hiding out in some hotel, where of course he is confronted by another S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who had also basically got fired. And that is Agent, and I'm going to mispronounce some names here, Valentina Algaria de Fontaine, she is an ex-lover of Nick Fury, off and on lover of Nick Fury. But basically, because Nick Fury got suspended, she does tell Nick Fury that some of the people who was very close to him also got suspended as well, including her. And so now her and Nick Fury can live a life together on the run, but of course be a couple once again. And so, of course, it does kind of lead to these two characters having some fun time. Now, of course, that is the moment we actually see Nick Fury and her wake up the next day. Now, you do have Valentina basically leave. And the reason why she leaves because, well, she says she has some kind of weird excuse. But, of course, she'll come right back to Nick Fury. Now, right off the bat, Nick Fury can tell something is off. And that is Nick Fury. He is able to realize when something is wrong, when something is off. And so basically you have Nick say, hmm, something is wrong with her. I'm going to follow her and make sure that everything is okay. But of course to make sure that she does not realize that basically she's being followed. And so of course you do have Nick Fury stay very hidden 
until he's able to realize what in the world is going on with her. And of course, he finds out that basically she wouldn't meet up with some other guy. Now, this other guy is, of course, asking her about Nick Fury. Like, hey, when are you going to make your move? When are you going to do this or that? Like, basically, this guy wants to know everything she is going to do to Nick Fury. And, of course, she tells this guy, don't worry, I am going to make my move very soon. But either way, though, she has no idea that her entire meeting with this guy was basically watched by Nick Fury. And he also heard her say, tell the queen, you know, this and that. And so basically telling us that this is not Valentina, the old lover of Nick Fury, this is basically a scroll. Now, of course, when this scroll, who's pretending to be Valentina, arrives back at the hotel, of course, she is confronted by Nick Fury, who is holding a gun. And he's kind of like, hey, who are you and why are you here? And of course, you have Valentina, this scroll, who's pretending to be Valentina, still trying her best to convince Nick Fury that she is Valentina and not a scroll. But of course, you have Nick like, nope, that's it. Bam, bam, she's dead. Just like that. And of course, you have Nick Fury then leave the dead body there so that the other scrolls could basically find her. And of course, when they do, you have Nick realize there are more scrolls out in the world who are right now pretending to be humans. And this is a problem. And so, of course, you have Nick like, okay, you know what? It's time for me to do some work because right now the entire world is basically in danger. But then you have Nick Fury go and find Maria Hill. Now remember, when Nick Fury basically lost his job as director of S.H.I.E.L.D., he basically got replaced by Maria Hill. And so, of course, you have Maria Hill in her job position right now running S.H.I.E.L.D. But you then have Nick Fury basically come to Maria Hill and he begins to question her. Now, of course, the reason why he's doing this because he wants to make sure that basically Maria Hill is not a scroll, that she is somebody that he can basically trust. And so, of course, he does ask her a few questions. But when he does that, and of course, she kind of passes tests, you then have Nick say, OK, listen. You have people right now who are surrounding you who are not who you believe they are to be. Basically meaning that he's trying to tell her in code the scrolls have basically replaced humans left and right. And of course, you have to watch your back. And of course, he does give her a few more tips on how to be a director of S.H.I.E.L.D. And right after that, he leaves. Now, of course, Maria Hill wants to arrest Nick Fury because, again, he did break some laws back in Secret War. And, of course, he is the most wanted man in the world. But, of course, this is Nick Fury. He knows how to get on the helicarrier and off it very quickly without, of course, setting off any alarms or being caught either. Now, that is the moment you do have Nick Fury basically meet up with Spider-Woman two months after Secret War. Of course, after he had basically went underground. But of course, in that time, he found out scrolls are invading the Earth. He also talked to Maria Hill. And now he's talking to Spider-Woman, Jessica Drew. Now, this is actually very important because... There was a time where Jessica lost her powers. And of course, she was confronted by Hydra. And Hydra did offer her to basically get her powers back. But she had to feed them information about S.H.I.E.L.D. And so, of course, you had Jessica actually go over to Nick Fury, told him what was going on. And of course, he told her, accept their offer. And of course, she did that. She joined Hydra. She basically got her powers back and she began to feed them information to them about S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, that information was information that Nick gave her to give to S.H.I.E.L.D., but of course, it was bogus information because at the same time, she was giving him information about Hydra. She was basically a double agent. Now, here's the thing though. That was when Nick Fury was still part of S.H.I.E.L.D. At this point right now, he is not. And so, of course, she's very angry at him because he left her dry out there on her own. And, of course, a lot of people were wondering if she is a double agent. And, of course, she had to tell people, no, I'm not one. I'm just a regular S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. 
But in reality, she was a double agent. But of course, when she sees Nick, she's angry. He's kind of like, listen, I know I left you out there by yourself. But hey, listen, something is going on. The scrolls are basically right now invading the earth. They are replacing people and pretending to be the people that they are basically replacing. And so, of course, that is the problem. And so now you are no longer a double agent. You're now a triple agent. You're going to report to S.H.I.E.L.D., report to HYDRA, but also report to me as well. Because again, Nick Fury is not part of S.H.I.E.L.D. anymore. And this is Nick Fury trying to figure out who is a scroll and who is not a scroll? He tells her, I'm going to figure out what in the world is going on. Now, this is actually very huge because if you saw my earlier videos, we learned that there is a possibility the queen of the scrolls have basically replaced Spider Woman and have been pretending to be her this entire time that we have been covering Secret Invasion. And so, of course, this could be the queen right now talking to Nick Fury, or it could be somebody else. It could actually be Spider-Woman. We have no idea, but it is Nick saying, I am going to stop the scrolls. Now, we actually do jump over to Nick Fury meeting up with Daisy Johnson, aka Quake. Now, at this point in Marvel Comics, Quake was a newer character. She only first appeared back in Secret Wars number two. And basically, she's a character, a young character, who has the ability to basically make earthquakes. And of course, Nick Fury found her. Now, this is Nick Fury basically telling us that when it comes to Quake, she is one of the kids in the world that Nick Fury had been watching over for a very long period of time because he believed these different kids across the world have the ability to actually come something great for the world down the road, but of course with his guidance. Now, when it comes to Quake and her earthquake abilities, she is the daughter of Mr. Hyde. Of course, a character that we have talked about a lot of times on my channel. But basically, thanks to his DNA being messed up, when he had passed his DNA on to her, of course, her DNA also got messed up. Now, on top of that, at first, the world believed that she was a mutant. But of course, she's not a mutant. Now, with Nick Fury coming to her, it's Nick Fury at first making sure that basically she is not a scroll by asking her a series of questions. And once she's able to actually answer all of those questions, you have Nick like, okay, listen, something is going to pop off very soon. And I need to make sure that you are somebody I can actually trust. And so, of course, I want to take you and the other kids that I have been watching over the world to form some kind of new team where, of course, we can handle different problems behind the scenes. So are you down to actually help me recruit these other characters? And you have Daisy say, yes, I am down. Now, the first person you have Nick Fury tell Daisy Johnson to basically go recruit is Phobos, the son of the God of War, Ares. Now, this was kind of interesting to me because I thought it was Nick Fury going around to basically recruit teenagers, except... The first person is literally a child, probably 8, 9, or 10. Now, if you're wondering, why is Ares the god of war on Earth right now with his son Phobos? Because you have to remember, at this point in Marvel Comics, after Civil War, you had two Avengers team. And Ares, the god of war, was on the mighty Avengers team, Iron Man's team. And so, of course, while he's away being Avenger, he wants his son Phobos to stay at home. And of course, Phobos does not want to stay at home. Now, at this point in Marvel Comics, Phobos only has the ability to cause fear in you, to basically make you feel fear. And that is it, really. Later on, he will show more powers down the road, but you do have Daisy coming to him kind of like, hey, listen, I want to take you in. I want to help you become something better down the road. And of course, you do have Fobo say, I'm down to join you. Let's go. Now, the next person you have Daisy Johnson actually go recruit is Yo-Yo Rodriguez. Now, Yo-Yo is actually the daughter of a character known as Griffin. Now, Griffin is an old 1970s character that most fans honestly never cared for. And honestly, 
I did not either. But either way though, when it comes to Griffin, kind of like Mr. Hyde and Daisy Johnson, Griffin's DNA was messed up. And because his DNA was messed up, of course, when he had a child, his child DNA was also messed up. And of course, it led to her basically getting powers. Now, of course, she gained super speed, hence the name Yo-Yo. I, well, actually, you know what? I still do not actually get the idea of Yo-Yo and speed. But either way, though, she is a speedster. And of course, you do have Daisy Johnson coming to her and kind of like, hey, listen, I work for a guy who's right now going around recruiting different people for this team this team of future heroes to come down the road to basically handle different things behind the scenes and of course he feels like you would be a great fit are you down and of course he she says yes and she does leave with daisy johnson now that is the moment you do have daisy johnson find another character and this character is jt slade now just like daisy phobos and yo-yo Basically, JT is a descendant of a character, and of course, he got powers from that character. JT Slade is the grandson of Carter Slade, the original Ghost Rider, or better known as the Phantom Rider. Yes, guys, before Johnny Blaze, there was another Ghost Rider. There were five Ghost Riders now. Maybe six, because I have not read current Ghost Rider books. Either way, though, the very first Ghost Rider was Carter Slade, a.k.a. the Phantom Rider. And of course, he did kind of pass on some of the hell powers to J.T. Slade. And so, of course, J.T. Slade is going to be another character that is going to join this team that Nick Fury is putting together. Now, you do have Daisy Johnson go find Layla Miller. Now, that's a name that should be very familiar because Layla Miller actually appeared, I want to say she first appeared back in House of M. But, of course, she was a character that was kind of used in a lot of Marvel books in the early 2000s and then just kind of, like, disappeared. But either way, though, Layla Miller is a character who just knows everything. Like, that's it. She just knows when something is going to happen. And... Honestly, nobody in Marvel had actually sat down and tried to explain her powers in details. But of course, when Daisy arrives, she's kind of like, yeah, I know why you're here. You want me to basically join your team. Well, I can't. You're better off without me. I can't tell you why. I just know that basically you're better off without me. And that's it. Like literally, that is Layla Miller and most of the books we see her in. Now, the next character you see Daisy go to recruit is Sebastian Drood. Now, Sebastian Drood is a character who believes right now that he has magical abilities. And so, of course, on his way, he's going to go see Doctor Strange to hopefully learn how to control his magical abilities. But, of course, he's confronted by Daisy Johnson, where you have Daisy tell him, listen, your powers aren't really magical that basically you are the son or the grandson of dr drood another marvel character but of course your dna is kind of messed up because you have part monster dna inside of you and so of course with that dna you're able to do different things but of course you think it's magic when in reality it's not magic but this is Daisy saying, I'm also here to basically recruit you for something better down the road, to make you better, but to also make the earth better down the road. Now, the last character you do see uh, Daisy Johnson go recruit is basically a character known as Stonewall, but also known as Jerry Sledge. Jerry Sledge is the actual son of the Absorbing Man, a character that Thor and the Hulk have fought so many times over the years in Marvel Comics. But basically, he's the son of the Absorbing Man. And when it comes to Stonewall, he literally has the same abilities as his father. Where, of course, if he touches something, he's actually able to turn his body into that material that he basically touched. And so, of course, if he touched metal, he turns his body into metal. If he touches gold, his body turns to gold. But either way, though, you do have Daisy coming to him kind of like, hey, listen. I want to help you make yourself better. I want to give you the chance to make the earth better. Are you down to basically join me? And he's all like, yeah, I'm down. Let's go. And of course, he does leave with her. 
And of course, after all of that, you have Daisy bring all of them to Nick Fury's safe house, where of course they do meet Nick Fury. Now, when they do, you have Nick Fury kind of like, okay, guys, welcome to your new life. Like basically your training begins now. Oh, on top of that, you have to make sure that you guys listen to every direction I give you, because if you don't, you will basically die. And so if you want to live, Listen to everything I have to tell you. Now, after all of that right there, you then have Nick say, hey, do anyone here know what a scroll is? And of course, we now know their first mission is to help take down the scrolls. Because remember, guys, this storyline right here takes place kind of in the past before Secret Invasion. But either way, though, this is where we are going to end today's comic book What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, guys, so we are going to continue our coverage. Wait, scratch that. We are going to begin our coverage over Secret Warriors. Now, when it comes to Secret Warriors, this was actually an idea that spun out of Secret Invasion. Let me explain. So when it came to Secret Invasion, it was this massive storyline where basically you had the scrolls coming to Earth, kidnapping people, and then pretending to be those people to do a slow invasion. Now, Nick Fury found out and he wanted to stop them. The problem was, though, at that point in Marvel Comics, Nick Fury was kicked out of S.H.I.E.L.D. And the reason why, because there was a five-part miniseries known as Secret War, where basically Nick Fury broke a bunch of laws. And when he broke those laws, of course he had to go undercover, or underground, so he could stay hidden from the rest of the world. Because if he was found, well of course he would be arrested. Now when he found out about the scrolls trying to take over the world, what he did was he created Created a team known as the Secret Warriors because these group of characters are characters he knew that he could actually trust. And these were characters that people did not know about. Like other superheroes had no idea about these characters. And also these were kids who knew they had powers but did not understand where those powers actually came from from and so that created the secret warriors it was basically nick fury going around and getting all these kids to come together to help him try to stop the scrolls now once the invasion was stopped now it wasn't because of nick fury because of norman osborne either way though after the invasion was stopped, Nick Fury realized that he still needed this team to do different things behind the scenes because there was so much corruption in the world, but also the idea that Norman Osborn is the one in charge of protecting America, Homeland Security, that right now he feels like, hmm, Norman Osborn cannot be trusted to do things right. But on top of that, there's also other problems that the superheroes or Norman Osborn do not know about. And so that means my secret warriors team is going to be used to handle those different problems behind the scene. Without anybody actually knowing, it was him and his new team of characters. And so with that, it gave birth to the Secret Warriors series, written by Jonathan Hickman. Now, the first story is written by Hickman and also Brian Michael Bendis. And so these two right here work together to kind of tell this story right here, the first one. And honestly, this right here is going to be one of the biggest retcons you see in this video right now. And so getting into today's storyline, we actually do pick up with the team right now in Odessa, Texas. Now, right now, you do have the team basically observing a S.H.I.E.L.D. base. Now, here is something I do want to mention real quick. When the team is out in the field, their team lead is basically quick. And the reason why, because, well, before this series, and really 
a couple years ago, Nick Fury and Daisy Johnson had actually worked together when they both worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. And on top of that, Nick Fury basically trained her as well because he knew about her powers. Now, with all that being said, though, when Nick Fury was creating this team, going around trying to grab all these different characters, the first person he grabbed was Daisy Johnson, Quake. And the reason why, because they're past with one another. He knows how great of a person she is, but on top of that, he looks at her kind of like, you can be a great leader one day, down the road with the proper training. And so this is your chance to get that training by being a leader of a team of new people who are trying to learn how to use their powers and learn where their powers have basically come from. Now, with all that being said, right now you do have the team in Odessa, Texas observing a shield base. And the reason why they're observing this base in Odessa is because, well, shield is no longer around and that right there is a huge problem because right after secret invasion spoiler alert uh, basically shield was shut down and the reason why because tony stark was the one in charge of shield he was basically put in charge of shield after nick fury had left the problem was though the scrolls were able to hack into his systems and of course some of those systems were in place in shield systems and so when he got hacked shield got hacked and so the american government felt like that shield was no longer a good fit to protect america and because norman osborne had basically saved the world they put him in charge instead he replaced shield with hammer and so this storyline does take place right in the middle of Dark Reign, the period of time where basically you had Norman Osborn in charge of Homeland Security. Now, with all that being said, though, the reason why they're observing this S.H.I.E.L.D. base, because again, it is a S.H.I.E.L.D. base, but for some strange reason, it hasn't been shut down completely and taken over by Hammer yet. And that right there is a problem. Now, while you have the team observing this space, that is the moment a bunch of Hydra agents have appeared. Now, remember, Hydra is one of those old Marvel organizations that has been around for decades on decades. But usually, if you see them somewhere, they got some big master plan coming down the road. Now, with that being being said though with hydra being here it's kind of like why is hydra at this shield base and so you do have our heroes actually jump in to basically stop hydra the problem is though as soon as they jump in the sentry arrives now the reason why the sentry is here because he's part of the dark avengers so when norman osborne took over protecting america homeland security he formed his own avengers team called the dark avengers and sentry was one of those characters and so we see sentry right now with a bunch of hammer agents and again hammer was the idea norman had to replace shield wit but either way you have the sentry and hammer arrive to stop hydra the problem is that as soon as Sentry and all those Hammer agents had arrived, well, Quake and her team of secret warriors had jumped in to stop Hydra originally. And so now they have to retreat because they honestly do not stand a chance against both Hammer and Hydra, but definitely not against a Sentry, somebody who's just way too powerful. And so you do have the secret warriors just basically retreat they get the heck out of there but when they do daisy johnson does see hydra being able to take a case of something and they teleport away and the question is right now what was inside that case now, when the team actually arrives back to the base, of course, they're confronted by Nick Fury. Now, this base was made off the books, so no one knows about this base at all. Because remember, right now, Nick Fury and his team, no one knows about them. But on top of that, Nick Fury has to stay hidden from the rest of the world because he broke a bunch of laws. Either way, though, right now you do have the team coming back to their base where they're confronted by Nick Fury. And of course, you have Nick Fury show that he's very upset with what the team basically did. And what happened was that the team was supposed to just 
observe the base and that is it, to gather intel about the base. And if Hydra did appear, again, just gather intel, that is it. But because the team saw Hydra, they stepped in to basically stop Hydra. Because again, it was a shield base that should have been shut down and replaced by Hammer by that point. But of course, Hammer has not done that yet. And so it still was just a regular shield base that was just left out there, but not being operated by anybody at all. And so to them, I'm kind of like, listen, there was a lot of different things in that shield base. We freaked out when we saw Hydra basically taking things out of that base. And so it felt like to us the right move to basically step in. But it's Nick Fury saying, I wanted you guys to gather intel so that I can confirm something I had doubts about, I learned about earlier in this year. And so it's kind of like if Nick had told them that, then maybe they would have done a better job. But because Nick did not tell them everything, it seems like, hey, we failed because you didn't actually tell us everything you wanted us to do. Now, JT Hellfire, he's very upset with how Nick Fury runs the team. He feels like Nick Fury needs to basically tell more information about these different kinds of missions before the team actually goes on those missions. But it's Nick Fury kind of like, no. I don't have to because again, I'm Nick Fury and you're just JT Hellfire, the son or the grandson of the original Ghost Rider. Who cares? And so Nick Fury walks away, but he tells Daisy to follow him. Now you do have the two characters actually go and check up on Phobos. Now Phobos is actually the son of Ares. Now I do want to mention one thing. When it comes to Phobos, and I really hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but when it comes to Phobos, in Marvel Comics, there has been different versions of the character, but at this point in Marvel Comics, this is the actual son of the God of War, Ares. Now with that being said, Nick Fury had also recruited this kid because no one knew about this kid at all. Like everyone knew about Ares, the God of War, but no one knew that this guy had a son named Phobos. Now when it comes to Phobos, he does have a lot of different abilities, but at this moment right now, they're kind of showing off the idea of how smart he is. And so with them being so smart, it will play a role down the road in later stories down the road, and so will the rest of his abilities as well. But Nick Fury wants to make sure that this god right here will grow up and be a great hero and not be like his father, Ares, the god of war. Even though right now at this point, Ares is technically part of the Avengers, I want to say. Or he was. I forgot. I want to say he was an Avenger until basically Norman Osborn took over. Either way, though, it's Nick Fury saying, like, we have to watch over this kid and hopefully train him in the correct way to make sure that he does not cause us problems down the road. But after that, you didn't have Nick Fury kind of explain why he was kind of upset with what Daisy Johnson and her team basically did in the field. Because again, he wanted them to just observe the shield base. That is it. Because again, he was trying to gather intel. But now it's Daisy Johnson realizing that something has spooked Nick Fury. And if something has spooked Nick Fury, that means right then and there, something really bad is going to happen down the road. Because Nick Fury is not somebody who gets easily spooked by anything at all in the universe. So if he gets spooked, that means something bad is about to happen or it already did happen. But then we actually pick up with Nick Fury one month ago. And right now, we actually see him in Chicago. Now, right now in Chicago, he's breaking into another base that's owned by S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, with that being said, of course, it seems like it's one of those bases that still operates as S.H.I.E.L.D., but hasn't fully been taken over by Hammer yet. Either way, though, you have Nick Fury basically breaking into this base in Chicago. And when he does, he was able to actually access information the base was holding. Now, you would think that because he has been kicked out of S.H.I.E.L.D. that he has no longer the ability to hack into the system or to access the system that S.H.I.E.L.D. has 
about different things that S.H.I.E.L.D. knows about. But this is Nick Fury showing us that he had access codes that no one else knew about just in case he ever got kicked out of S.H.I.E.L.D. that he could use to override a system so that he could access the system. Either way, though, when he does access the system, he does download a bunch of information. And the information that he downloaded is going to be very important for this storyline. And so then we see Nick Fury actually breaking into the White House. Now, this actually happens two days prior from the present day, but 28 days after Chicago. Now, with all that being said, this is Nick Fury sitting down with the president for two things. The first is that is Nick Fury wanting to know why in the world did the president let the government basically get rid of shield and replace shield with hammer and so you have the president tell nick fury that the reason why shield was destroyed and replaced with hammer is because the president in the american government wanted more control over some organization that was made to protect America. And when it came to S.H.I.E.L.D., they honestly did not have full control over S.H.I.E.L.D. But with Hammer, they can. Now, honestly, they really can't because it's Norman Osborn. He's a crazy bad guy. Either way, you did have Nick Fury basically say, okay, fine, whatever. But here's the thing, though. I was the one who attacked that shield base in Chicago. It's Nick Fury telling the president about that moment. And the reason why, because that was one of the bases across America that no one really knew about except maybe Nick Fury and a handful of other people. But those bases should be shut down by now. And the reason why, because those bases are holding a lot of different things. But on top of that, those bases are very important for something else we're going to see down the road. And so this is Nick Fury saying, I have nine locations of bases that were basically kept off the book. Here is the list of those bases, and you need to basically shut down those bases before something else big happens in America. And so we actually do jump back over to Nick Fury and Daisy Johnson in the present day. And this is really Nick Fury explaining to Daisy what he's trying to tell her, what he's so spooked about. And what he is saying is that basically when it comes to the idea of these bases across America, there are nine of them. And these nine bases should have been secured by now because these nine bases were originally kept off S.H.I.E.L.D. books. But either way, though, someone in S.H.I.E.L.D. knew about these nine bases. And so when Hammer took over S.H.I.E.L.D., that information should have gotten over to Hammer so that they could basically secure those bases. The problem is, though, Hammer did not know about all nine different bases. But here's the thing, though. When Nick Fury broke into the base in Chicago, he was able to get that list of nine bases. And so when he went to the White House, he did give the president a list, but he only gave two of the nine locations to the president. And the reason why, because he wants to make sure that the current administration in office right now can be trusted. And so he only gave him two of the nine for the time being. But with that being said though, those two locations are very important because one of those locations were actually secured by Hammer, meaning that that base is cleared now by Hammer. The other base though was in Odessa, Texas, the ones that basically Quake and her team were at and they were supposed to observe and not do anything else. And the reason why Nick Fury is saying these nine bases are very important because it ties back into Hydra. And so this is Nick Fury saying that Hydra was not attacking these bases. Hydra was not actually breaking into these bases. Hydra was going to these bases to basically take things they had already there, meaning that these nine shield bases across America were never actually shield. They were Hydra, which means that Hydra, for who knows how long, has been somewhat controlling shield this entire time. And so it's Nick Fury saying, technically, I have been working for the bad guys 
without actually knowing I was working for the bad guys. And that is one of the biggest retcons we're seeing right now in Marvel Comics and in the storyline. Because now you're saying that S.H.I.E.L.D. had possibly never had just worked for the American government, but possibly has been working for HYDRA in helping HYDRA without even knowing they were helping HYDRA out. And so getting into the second issue, we actually pick up with the underwater city that's actually owned by HYDRA. Yes, they do have an underwater city, just go with it. Either way though, with this underwater city, is right now being run by Baron Von Strucker. Now when it comes to HYDRA, you usually have one leader for HYDRA, but sometimes occasionally you have multiple leaders, and sometimes you have a civil war in the actual HYDRA organization. Now at this point right now, Baron Von Strucker is kind of in charge of this city, or this particular group of HYDRA, or this branch of HYDRA. Either way though, right now we're told that this section right here takes place three months in the past, but on top of that, it also takes place right in the middle of Secret Invasion. And that right there is actually very important. And the reason why, because when we actually pick up with Baron Von Strucker, you do have some random agents of Hydra coming into his office to tell them the news, or tell him, sorry, about the news of what's happening right now across the world, where basically different operations or different organizations have been taken over by this alien race known as the Scrolls. But apparently Hydra has been untouched meaning that no scroll has been able to actually invade the Hydra organization, which right there tells Baron Von Strucker that can't be true. And the reason why, because when it comes to the scrolls, they're trying to invade the entire earth. And you want to make sure that you have somebody in every single organization across the world to make sure that your invasion could actually be accomplish and so with that being said is baron von strucker realizing hmm these three agents are basically lying to me that they are actually scrolls and also he has a way to know that they are scrolls and so he tells them i know that you are scrolls i know that basically right now you're here to take me out to replace me and then use hydra for your own personal needs I am not going to actually let that happen. And so you have Baron Von Strucker kill off these scrolls that were pretending to be Hydra agents. And then he blows up the entire underwater city base. The entire city. He even says, there was probably 10,000 folks down there of Hydra agents. But I had no choice because I had no idea how many scrolls have replaced my agents. But to make sure that basically they are dead and there's no one else in there to betray me, I blew up the entire underwater city. Gone just like that. Because it was him realizing that the scrolls have begun the process of actually taking over everything across the world. And so getting back over to the present day and actually picking up with Daisy Johnson and Nick Fury, this is basically Nick Fury telling Daisy Johnson, yes, what I just told you is the truth, that in reality, this entire time when I was working for S.H.I.E.L.D., our S.H.I.E.L.D. has been around, Hydra was secretly controlling S.H.I.E.L.D., which means that every single time Nick Fury or anybody who had a connection to S.H.I.E.L.D. was actually stopping Hydra, they weren't really actually stopping Hydra. It was part of Hydra's plan to pretend that they were basically being stopped, but in reality, it was just another way for them to continue on with their master plans to control the entire world. And so it's Nick Fury saying that this entire time we have been helping them and not actually stopping them. And so now we have to change that. We need to wake up, meaning that we need to tell Hydra that we know what they have been doing. And when they realize that we know, that is when we are going to get even with them. And so then we jump back one month ago where we actually pick up with Baron Von Strucker once again. And when we do, we actually see him right now in New Zealand in this new base 
where of course you do have his assistant coming to him and telling him, hey boss, listen, we're getting a lot of new recruits. This is great. We're in the thousands. Don't worry. Sooner or later, we can actually make up our loss from the underwater city explosion. Now, while you have the two characters actually talking to one another, well, that is the moment she tells Baron Von Strucker, oh, by the way, uh, Nick Fury attacked a base in Chicago and gathered some intel about you know what, the nine bases across America. And so this tells Baron Von Strucker that Nick Fury finally realized that this entire time they have been battling against each other throughout all these years was basically for nothing because Hydra was controlling S.H.I.E.L.D. And so this is Baron Von Strucker saying about time, about time you finally realized, but you found out a little bit too late and now it's time for me to make sure you're stopped before you could ruin the rest of my plans. Now, getting back into the present day, we actually do pick up with Daisy Johnson, meeting up with the rest of the team. Now, when she does, of course, she's telling the team, hey, guys, listen, we just got our next mission. Like, basically, the boss want us to wrap up dinner, get back to base, and get ready for our next mission, which right now we have to handle. Now, remember, guys, earlier we saw JT Hellfire kind of not liking the idea of being bossed around by Nick Fury. And so he feels like Nick Fury needs to kind of open up more and actually be a better boss than he is right now. Either way, you do have most of the characters kind of ignore him completely. Now, this is also the section where you have Phobos actually tell everybody their possible future to come down the road because that's one of his powers where he could see a possible future it doesn't mean it's actually going to happen but it could possibly happen now when it comes to phobos he does look over to yo-yo and really hers is the most important and the reason why because when it comes to yo-yo what he's saying is that basically Something is going to happen to her. Something very seriously bad is going to happen to her. And Stonewall is going to watch over her. And that right there is actually very important because it could possibly happen down the road in this video or the next one. But either way, you do have the team wrap up dinner and they say, okay, fine, let's go ahead and get back to base and see what in the world Nick Fury has planned for us this time. But getting back over to New Zealand, we actually do pick up with Baron Von Strucker calling in the rest of the leaders of Hydra, which means that he plans to bring in the five leaders of Hydra to begin the process of doing some master plan against Nick Fury, but the rest of the world. And so besides him, you also have Viper, you also have Madam Hydra, you have Kraken, and you have the Hive. Now, this is only four out of the five. There's still one more they're basically waiting for. But getting back to the present day, we actually pick up with Nick Fury talking to the Secret Warriors. And when he does, he tells them, hey guys, listen, here's the big news. Hydra this entire time has been controlling S.H.I.E.L.D. And so it's time for us to fight back. It's time for us to attack them back and do something crazy, but... I need someone to basically go undercover into Hydra. And it's kind of like, who will that person actually be? And so then we jump two days in the past. Now, when we do, we actually pick up with the Temple of Resurrection. And this actually belongs to the Hand. Now, remember, the Hand is basically this ninja organization that's evil, really, but also has their hand, no pun intended, into different kinds of operations and organizations across the world. Now, with that being said, though, they also worship a demon as their god. Now, here comes the thing. The Hand and Hydra are right now talking about a deal. And this makes sense because if you have been following our secret invasion coverage, we basically saw that when Elektra was replaced by a scroll, that scroll Elektra was trying to actually regain control of the Hand away from Hydra. 
but we saw that she was able to. But it seems like some parts of the hand was still being controlled by Hydra. And so when we actually pick up with this section right here, we see that this group may be still controlled by Hydra. And right now is Hydra saying, listen, we had a deal that sooner or later, we want you guys to bring somebody back to life. And right now we're ready because we went to our base in Odessa, Texas, and we took that container that was basically holding the dead body of our fifth leader of Hydra. And so you have the hand use their dark magic to bring this person back to life. And we come to find out it is Gorgon. Gorgon is the fifth leader of the Hydra group. And with that being said, he also has the ability to turn you to stone if you look into his eyes. Either way, now all the leaders of Hydra are here now. But then we jump over to the third issue. Now, when we do, we do kind of find out that basically the third issue does pick up two weeks after the second issue. And so in those two weeks, you basically had Hydra go to those different bases that were originally kept off the book by Hydra. Because remember, those bases were made by S.H.I.E.L.D., but in reality, they were Hydra bases, since Hydra had technically owned S.H.I.E.L.D. in some kind of way. And so with that, in the last two weeks, Hydra has been going to the different bases across America that were kept off book that were originally thought to be S.H.I.E.L.D. bases, but actually be Hydra bases. Now, with that being said, though, only two bases are left. There's one base that was already secured by Hammer. The other base, though, is the one that's left that Hydra has not attacked yet. And so, of course, right now you have Nick Fury and Daisy saying the Secret Warriors are going to the last base that Hydra has basically not attacked yet and tried to recover their lost items. On top of that, this is the moment you have the Secret Warriors kind of learn about the different leaders of Hydra except Gorgon. Because even though he was brought back to life, they have no intel or the idea that he's also on the list right now as leaders of Hydra. Now, this also the moment where you have JT, a.k.a. Hellfire, show again his attitude towards Nick Fury. Because, again, he hates the idea of just doing these observed missions. He wants to actually fight and show off his ability as a fighter. But this is Nick Fury putting him in his place and say, when you're out in the field, Daisy is in charge. When you're here, I'm in charge. But if Daisy says you are only going to observe and that is it, then you are only going to do that. I have no idea why on this power trip right now, but boy, sit down before you make a big mistake by coming after me. Now, while you have the Secret Warriors going to that other location that Hydra is about to attack, we actually pick up with Nick Fury meeting up with Valentina Allegra de Vautain. Yes, that's her whole name. And yes, I hope I pronounced that correctly. But we're going to call her Valentina. Now, when it comes to Valentina, she's actually an old lover of Nick Fury. And usually when these two characters actually meet up, occasionally, they do make love but nine out of ten times when you see Nick Fury coming to her it's really more of like hey man listen I need your help with something and you are the only person that I actually trust when it comes to accomplishing these different things now of course for Valentina she's kind of like hmm it's kind of weird how Nick Fury is calling for my help when he's no longer working for S.H.I.E.L.D. So why in the world are you calling for my help when you no longer work for S.H.I.E.L.D.? Now, you don't have Nick Fury flat out and tell her why he wants her help, but this is him trying to see if she's someone that he can actually trust still. And on top of that, he's hoping that he can convince her to actually help him with a certain kind of task. Now, while they're having dinner with one another in Mexico, it's still also showing that she'll do anything for Nick Fury because how much she cares for him. But at the same time though, she's like, I don't trust you and I know you don't trust me. 
Now, picking up with the Secret Warriors, they actually do go to the Red Worm. And the Red Worm is actually the last base that hasn't been touched by Hydra. Or, well, that's what they believe. Because when the Secret Warriors actually arrive at that location, they do see that Hydra is already there. And, of course, these ages are with Gorgon. And this does tell the Secret Warriors that basically, hey... This is possibly the last leader of the Hydra group. Now they have their five leaders. What are they planning to do? Now you do have the secret warriors kind of observing again. Try to see what Hydra is planning to do. Now Hydra had already took some shield agents that were still there at that facility and begin the process of actually killing them off. Now when they do that, of course, you do have the secret warriors say, okay, Okay, we have to jump in and save those people. And so it does lead into a battle between the secret warriors against Hydra and Gorgon. Now, Gorgon is a very powerful character by himself, but with the help of Hydra Aegis, Honestly, the secret warriors do not stand a chance. And so with that being said, while they're fighting against uh, Gorgon in the Hydra Ages, you do realize that they're having a hard time winning this battle. And so they're like, hey, we have to retreat. And so they try to use Yo-Yo as a way to kind of basically help with the escape process. And remember, when it comes to Yo-Yo, she has super speed, but you also have to remember Remember that she was told earlier by Phobos that there is a possibility something seriously bad is going to happen to her. And it does right here. Because when she tries to attack Gorgon to help the others to get away, he basically cuts her so bad she loses both of her arms. She flies away and crash. And they're all like, oh my God, she's seriously injured. We have to escape right now. Now, you do have Phobos being this god trying to actually stand up against Gorgon, but this is Daisy reminding the little boy they have to leave because one of their own just got cut really bad. And honestly, they need to get her out of here to basically get her somewhere for some medical help. And so they all leave. But when they all leave, you did have Gorgon tell Phobos that sooner or later, he is going to kill a god, meaning that he's coming after Gorgon. Now, of course, with her getting seriously injured, they do realize that they have to take her somewhere so that she'll find or get some medical help, which you do have Nick Fury say he does have a base somewhere where basically he does have some robots that will be able to actually help Yo-Yo and give her some medical help. But after they're able to get to that location, you have Nick Fury pull Daisy to the side and say the secret warriors are basically bench. He's all like, listen, until Yo-Yo is back on her feet right now, you have to find your replacement. And so your next goal is to find your replacement. Now for Daisy, she's kind of like, what about Hydra? We're on Hydra case right now. I should continue to be working on that. But this is Nick Fury saying, no, your bench, I'll handle Hydra. And so this is Nick Fury saying, I'm going to call in another team to actually help out with this situation with Hydra. And so he calls up Dumb Dumb Dugan. And he's all like, hey, man, listen, it's time for us to get the team together. But getting into the fourth chapter, we actually do pick up with Daisy Johnson, Quake, and also Drood right now in Australia. Now they flew there, but the problem is though, Drood crashed a plane. And so they have to walk the rest of the way to the location that they're trying to get to. And of course, they're trying to recruit somebody to replace Yo-Yo. Now this character that they are trying to replace has the ability to teleport almost anywhere across the universe thanks to his ability to warp reality in a way to teleport him and anybody else around him to a specific location. Either way though, right now they're going to basically recruit Manifold. And this is actually very important because if you saw my videos over Avengers and New Avengers by Jonathan Hickman, you know that Manifold is a very important character in that series. And so right now, 
This is Hickman beginning to do the work on the character to build him up so that he'll be used in later books down the road. But at first, he's like, oh, so I know that you guys are here to recruit me, but I might have to say no. But then we pick up with Nick Fury. But this actually brings in the idea of the Howling Commandos. Because Nick Fury is going to make a new version of the Howling Commandos. Now, the Howling Commandos were basically a military group that was sent on different missions by the military to basically deal with different things happening across the world that could affect America. Now, when it comes to the Howling Commandos, they were led by Nick Fury. But we were told that this team has been around for decades on decades on decades but been led by Nick Fury and of course that does bring into question if this team been around for so long how come Nick Fury is not old or super old to the point where he can barely walk why he looks so young well thanks to the infinity formula thanks to that formula it basically slowed down Nick Fury's aging process and because he took that formula over and over and over again throughout a good amount of years well of course it definitely slowed down his aging process and so that is how he's still around right now but still looks somewhat young and being able to actually function in today's society now with that being said though this is him trying to bring back the howling commandos but in a different kind of way but then we actually pick up with JT and also Phobos. Now, right now, you have JT and Phobos kind of looking around the office of Nick Fury to basically find different things that Nick Fury is hiding from them. But on top of that, hoping that they'll be able to get some information on what's really happening with Nick Fury in this Hydra situation. Now, while the two characters are looking around, of course, they do find a hidden passageway. And when they do, of course, they walk into a room and that room, they find a bunch of life model decoys now these life model decoys are basically robots but they look so real that if someone actually used one of them you believe it's the actual person but in reality it's just a robot and nick fury is known to using a lot of life model decoys as a way to make sure that he's not trapped in some kind of situation and nine out of ten times People actually believe that they are talking to Nick Fury, but in reality, it's never Nick Fury. And so they're kind of like, what in the world is going on here? Now, getting back over to Nick Fury in the Howling Commandos, you do have Dum Dum Dugan and some other members of the Howling Commandos tell them what is their current situation. Because most of the members of the Howling Commandos were part of S.H.I.E.L.D. because Nick Fury was part of S.H.I.E.L.D., but when S.H.I.E.L.D. basically got taken down and replaced by Hammer, most of the Howling Commandos said, fine, forget it. We're going to jump ship as well and continue to be the Howling Commandos, but not be part of S.H.I.E.L.D. nor Hammer. We're just contractors now for different kinds of missions across the world. But this is Nick Fury saying he needs the Howling Commandos to kind of deal with the Hydra problem. Now, here's the thing, though. You do have Dum Dum Dugan say, listen, when it comes to the Howling Commandos Corporation or this organization we're trying to build, our army is small. And the reason why, because right now, most of the men they had originally who were part of S.H.I.E.L.D., well, they joined Hammer because they still needed some kind of salary. And so it's Dum Dum Dugan say, listen, we do have a small army here. And most of these men, like us, did not want to join Hammer. And so they left S.H.I.E.L.D., they left Hammer, and joined us here for the Howling Commandos Corporation. But when it comes to some men we used to have, those men had no choice but to join Hammer because they needed money to take care of their family, their wife and kids. And so this is Nick Fury kind of like, okay, you're telling me you have a small army, you have a small base, we can still work with this as a way to attack Hydra to get back at them for all the years for playing with us and pretending that they had no control over S.H.I.E.L.D. but in reality they did. But then we pick up with uh, Daisy Johnson aka Quake and Drood 
And of course, right now they're trying to convince uh, Manifold to basically join them and become a new member of the Secret Warriors. Now, at first, he does say no. And the reason why, because another character known as Gateway, who has the ability to also teleport, tells Manifold, no, you are not ready. Well, originally, he told him no before Daisy Johnson and um, the Druid arrived to try to basically recruit Manifold. But then you have Gateway say no. You can join her team. Now, this is actually very important because this is Gateway telling Manifold, I told you, no, you can't join Nick Fury's team, but you can join her team. And so it's kind of like, wait, what do you mean Nick Fury's team, but he can join my team? Does Nick Fury have another team out there that we don't know about? And so Gateway's kind of like, uh, I can't tell you, but... You can take Manifold. He can join your little team right now if he wants to. And of course, you do have Manifold say yes, he's down to join this team. But do we pick up with the leaders of Hydra? Now, this is the leaders of Hydra coming together and basically finding out that Nick Fury knows about the idea that S.H.I.E.L.D. was never actually taking down Hydra piece by piece. In reality, Hydra controls S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hydra was using S.H.I.E.L.D. to build up Hydra piece by piece. And so this is the leaders of Hydra coming together to actually say, we should attack Nick Fury, get rid of him before he ruins our entire organization completely by doing different things across the board. Now, there is something else I do want to mention because this is actually going to be very important because when it comes to Hydra, Viper, who you see on the screen right now, she used to be known as Madam Hydra, but also Viper. But at this point in Marvel Comics, she's just Viper. And her other code name, Madam Hydra, now belongs to somebody else. The question is though, who is Madam Hydra? Because Viper was Madam Hydra, but she's no longer Madam Hydra. And so we have a new character right now pretending to be Madam Hydra, but we have no idea who it is yet. Getting back over to Nick Fury in the Howling Commandos, this is really Nick Fury telling us, the readers, that even though they have a small army of the Howling Commandos Corporation, this is still a good enough army to basically attack Hydra. Now, you do have some members of the Howling Commandos questioning Nick Fury in the way of like, are you going to be okay when you have to shoot people who used to work for S.H.I.E.L.D. but had no choice but to work for Hammer as a way to basically support their family? Because if you shoot and kill them, then their family no longer has their father, their mother, their brother, sister, whatever. But for Nick Fury, it's kind of like, listen, I am not going to have any kind of hard feelings when I kill someone off to basically help with this mission. We are going to attack Hydra and their base and hopefully do some damage to Hydra. But at the same time, if some of our own men get in the way because they had no choice to join Hammer or to join Hydra, honestly, I cannot feel bad for them. And so this is Nick Fury saying, let's go. We're going to attack Hydra where it actually hurts. Now, jumping into the fifth chapter, we actually do pick up with a couple agents right now who work for Hammer talking to one another. Now, one of them is important. His name is Eric, and you'll see why here in a moment. But while you have the two agents talking to one another, one of them is kind of like a brand new agent. But not to Hammer, but he was new to S.H.I.E.L.D. And what I mean is that in the two years he worked for S.H.I.E.L.D., at, at the end of his second year, of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. went away and then Hammer came in and he had no choice but to join Hammer as a way to kind of support his life. But when it comes to Eric, Eric been around for years and years and years. He says 28 years, I was with S.H.I.E.L.D. It sucks that S.H.I.E.L.D. is gone, but I went Hammer. Now, of course, you have Eric begin to talk to this other guy, the newer guy. And while they're talking, you basically have this guy kind of try to give away a hint like, you should probably go somewhere rather than be here. And the reason why, because Eric is one of the Howling Commandos who's working for Nick Fury. And so by the time the newer guy finds out, he looks up to the sky and see a bunch of helicopters coming in at a very fast pace. And he's like, hey, uh, what are those 
we need to call that in. And bam, he's shot from behind by Eric because again, Eric is part of the Howling Commandos. And the helicopters that are coming in right now are of course, Nick Fury and the rest of the Howling Commandos militia. Now you're probably wondering why in the world is Nick Fury actually attacking this hammer base, but not really going after Hydra? Because Nick Fury knows that if Hydra had their hands in shield, then most likely Hydra have their hands also in hammer. And so basically this is really more Nick Fury saying, if we attack this hammer base, two things gonna happen. One, nothing at all, or two, Hydra is going to appear. And so while you have Hammer and Shield, or really the Howling Commandos and Hammer fighting against one another, Hydra's on the sideline like, we're ready to go. Everybody is in position. And I just realized that all three organizations who's going to fight in this battle all start with H. Hammer, Hydra, and Howling Commandos. Either way though, you do have all three team members or all three teams about to fight against one another. But then we pick up with the generals of Hydra 13 hours ago. Now this is the moment where we actually learn that when it comes to the generals, they actually heard from somebody, an inside source from the Howling Commandos that Nick Fury was actually going to attack Hammer Base. Now this is the perfect time for Hydra to actually attack Nick Fury in the Howling Commandos because Hydra knows that if they want to go ahead and finish this battle against Nick Fury, they have to do it now. Because if they allow him to live, it's going to be a long war. And if this war goes on, Nick Fury is going to win. And when he does win, it's all over for basically Hydra. And so this is Hydra saying, release the horde so that we can basically go ahead and wrap up this battle here and now. And so getting back to the present day, we actually do pick up with the battle between Hydra, Hammer, and also the Howling Commandos. Now this battle does go on for a good while. And matter of fact, with this battling going on, you do have a lot of sides basically losing a lot of men and women. Now as the battle does continue on, you do have Nick Fury actually look over to Gorgon. Now when he does, he's all like, ooh, Gorgon's here. I hate him, he hates me. Now Gorgon wants to actually kill off Nick Fury, but of course he fails when he tries to kill Nick Fury. But as the battle goes on, Nick Fury is actually trapped by Kraken and Baron Von Strucker. And it does look like there is a possibility that Nick Fury is about to die. The problem is though, and really it's a problem for Hydra, not Nick Fury, that while you have Hydra thinking they're about to win the battle between Hydra, Hammer, and also Howling Commandos, that is the moment you do have the secret warriors arrive in time to actually help out the Howling Commandos defeat Hydra. But then we actually jump back a couple hours ago and we actually pick up with the secret warriors and we see how they were basically called in to actually deal with this situation. Because when it comes to the secret warriors, they're telling us that while they were at the base just chilling and minding their business, well, that was the moment they got a call from Nick Fury saying, hey, we need your help. Like the panic button for Nick Fury is saying he needs help and you guys need to get there right now to basically help him out. Now this does confuse the secret warriors. And the reason why, because when it comes to the secret warriors, they thought they were benched. Matter of fact, Nick Fury said, you guys are basically benched. And the reason why, because Y'all need to basically train your team while I deal with Hydra with the Howling Commandos. But now it seems like he does need help and he they, they're like, hey, we got to go. Let's go help him right now. Now, when it comes to the battle, the battle does turn into the favor of the Howling Commandos and also Secret Warriors because now Hydra has to deal with two different groups and the Secret Warriors are a group of characters who basically have some powers on them that could do some heavy damage. And so right now, is Hydra actually losing this battle? But here comes the thing though. Some of the leaders are not actually here when it comes to Hydra. Madam Hydra and Viper are both missing. And the question is right now, where are they?
because we come to find out that right now they are in Japan. Now, the reason why they're in Japan, because right now they're making the deal with the Silver Samurai and his clan. Now, when it comes to the Silver Samurai, his clan is one of the most powerful families in Japan. But on top of that, Silver Samurai has a long time connection with Viper. Even when she was Madame Hydra, they still had a long time connection. But this is where we kind of find out why Viper was so close to Silver Samurai. And the reason why? Because she basically needed some kind of box from him. And so now she has the box. She's kind of like, listen, this entire time where it seemed like I may like you and you liked me, we could have been a couple. You need to realize I basically used you because I wanted this box. Now we have no idea what's inside the box, but this is her really telling him that is the reason why I actually came to you for. And so they leave. Now, getting back over to the battle between the Howling Commandos, Hydra, and also Hammer, we come to find out that basically Hammer had gave up. Hydra also gave up. Howling Commandos and the Secret Warriors won the battle and they can see another day. Now, as soon as they won the battle, this is where we kind of learn what Nick Fury was trying to do with this battle. He was trying to do a number to Hydra by basically taking out some of their agents, but also beating up on their leaders. But at the same time, now you have 3,000 men who used to work for Hammer, have quit Hammer, and now going to work for the Howling Commandos militia. And so now the Howling Commandos military has been built up even more. And so now their numbers have even gotten better. And right there is a very important piece of information. And so you do have the Secret Warriors, the Howling Commandos, and also uh, Nick Fury. They all go back to their separate ways. But this is Nick Fury telling Dum Dum Dugan, the Howling Commandos militia, the numbers need to be higher, which means you need to recruit more people and we need to gather more money to basically pay these guys. But what we're doing right now can actually help us down the road. So this is a good start. But then one day later, we actually pick up with Nick Fury and also Quake talking to one another about the button. Because remember, she got a call earlier that Nick Fury needed help. And so she thought it was Nick Fury calling for help. We come to find out Nick Fury never called for help. Matter of fact, someone else hit the button. And the question is though, who hit the button? Now, Nick Fury kind of gives her the idea that he does know who hit the button, but he's not going to tell her who he believes who hit the button. And so we're left to wonder who actually did hit the button. Now, as Quake leaves the office, you do have Nick Fury get a call. And that call is actually from Angelina. Now, this comes into a very huge shocking moment. And the reason why it's such a huge shocking moment is because we kind of find out that the new Madame Hydra is actually Angelina. And she's right now holding the box that Silver Samurai gave her and Viper earlier. And so now we know that Angelina had joined Hydra, but she's telling Nick Fury that she has not been bad enough just yet, meaning that she plans to do something else down the road. The question is though, what? And so getting into today's storyline for today's video, we actually do pick up with the character known as Hellfire about to rob a bank. Yes, you heard that right. Hellfire is about to rob a bank. Now remember, Hellfire is part of the Secret Warriors, but on top of that, he is the grandson of the original Ghost Rider. Because a lot of folks don't realize this, when it comes to Ghost Riders, Johnny Blaze is not the first one. The first one is actually known as the Phantom Rider, but later on they called him a Ghost Rider. Either way, Hellfire is the grandson of the original Ghost Rider, Phantom Rider. Either way, that is the moment we kind of find out that Hellfire is actually not alone. Matter of fact, the entire Secret Warriors team is there right now to help him rob the bank. 
Now, once they're able to gather all the money in the bank, of course, our team thinks the money is for them. But that is the moment you have Nick Fury walk in and say, no, the money is not for you. It's for Dum Dum Dugan and the Howling Commandos. Now, originally, the Howling Commandos was Nick Fury team back in the 1940s and the 1950s. But at this point in Marvel Comics, the Howling Commandos is actually a private military group that people can hire for different things. Either way, they need money. They need funding. And so this is right now Nick saying, hey, all the money in this bank right now is going to them as a way to fund them. My team, you guys, we don't need money. So hurry up, get the money, and let's leave. Now, the other reason why they're robbing this bank is because this bank actually belongs to Hydra. Because we have to remember that when it came to our last video, we found out that S.H.I.E.L.D. was actually being controlled by Hydra this entire time up to this point in Marvel Comics, which honestly makes sense because if you think about it, S.H.I.E.L.D. could never actually stop Hydra. Hydra always got away. And the reason why? Because they were being controlled by Hydra. Now, with that being said, though, we kind of find out that Baron Von Strucker is very upset. And matter of fact, he is the leader of Hydra. But the reason why he's so upset because that bank that just got robbed, that was his bank. That was all his money. Gone. Just like that. And so he calls up Norman Osborn. Now, when he calls up Norman Osborn, we also have to remember that Norman Osborn is actually the leader of Homeland Security. Because after Secret Invasion, you had the American government say, you know what? A good idea is this right here. Norman Osborn should be the person in charge of protecting America. And the reason why? Because he killed off the Queen Scroll back in Secret Invasion. And so you had the American government say he is now in charge in protecting America. And so he got rid of S.H.I.E.L.D. He brought in Hammer to replace S.H.I.E.L.D., but he also formed the Dark Avengers. Now, this is Baron Von Strucker coming to Norman saying, listen, I need you to go kill off Nick Fury. And matter of fact, you should want to kill off Nick Fury because he'd been wanted by the American government even before you were in office, Norman. And if you're able to actually get him and kill him, just think how the American government will look at you then. You got the most wanted person in the world and you killed him or even locked him up. You will be loved like no other. But at the same time, it's Norman saying, honestly, I don't care about Nick. But if I do grab Nick, you owe me one, Baron Von Strucker. You owe me one big time. And so they have a deal. It's right now Norman Osborn trying to find Nick Fury, grab him, and hopefully kill him. Now we also have to remember that when it comes to Norman Osborn, even though he did form the Dark Avengers, he's also still in charge of the Thunderbolts. It's just that this team right now is really more a bunch of C-list characters who's just right now working for him because, hey, we need a Thunderbolt book because the series was so popular at this point in Marvel Comics. Either way, we also see that he had called then Ares the God of War. Now, there is a very good reason why he's calling Ares God of War for, and we're going to find out very, very soon. And that is the moment where we actually jump over to Nick Fury. Now, when we do, it's Nick Fury right now listening to his team complain about the idea that they're unable to actually keep any of the money that they had stole from that bank earlier. And honestly, you have Nick tell the Secret Warriors to just get over it and move on with their lives because honestly, they have other things to worry about. Now, that is the moment where you do have Phobos appear. Now, Phobos is the son of Ares. And right now, it's Phobos coming to Nick Fury and saying, hey man, listen, it's about time. Now, we have no idea what these two characters are actually talking about. Like, time for what? We have no idea. But apparently, it's time for something big. And so, right now, you have Fobo saying you have to go. Because it's time for you to do that thing. And so, you have Nick leave to handle this situation. 
But after Nick Fury leaves, later on that night, we actually do pick up with Hellfire and Phobos right now watching the monitors to make sure that if any kind of alert pops up, they have to go and form the rest of the team. Now, while the two characters are watching the monitors, that is the moment an alert does pop up. And you do have our two characters right now check to see what that alert is all about. And then come to find out the alert came from Black Widow. Now, this section right here, it ties into what's happening right now at this point in Marvel Comics over in the Thunderbolts book. Because at this same moment right now in Thunderbolts, you have Songbird fighting against the Thunderbolts. But of course, she got her butt kick and Black Widow had to blow her cover to save Songbird and they're trying to get away from the Thunderbolts who are right now trying to arrest Black Widow but also arrest Songbird. And so right now, it's Black Widow sending help over to Nick Fury saying, hey Nick, I need your help right now. I'm on the run. The problem is though, Nick is not here. Right now, you have Hellfire and Phobos answering the call and so you have Fobo say you know what we don't need Nick this is something we can actually handle and so you do have Phobos and Hellfire say let's go save the Black Widow and Songbird. Now that is the moment where we actually do pick up with Nick Fury. Now when we do pick up with Nick Fury right now we actually do see him right now about to pay a visit to someone very important. And this right here is going to begin a new storyline that Donovan Hickman is going to carry over to the rest of the entire series of Secret Warriors. But we kind of find out that right now you have Nick Fury meeting up with Jonathan Garrett. Now, Jonathan Garrett is actually an old character who appeared back in Elektra Assassin number two, and he was created by Frank Miller. But like I said, when it comes to this character right here and other things happening after this book right here, it's all going to tie together by Jonathan Hickman. But right now, it's Nick Fury calling in Jonathan Garrett for a special mission. Now, you can tell right off the bat that Jonathan Garrett is technically mostly a cyborg than human because back in the Elektra storyline, he was badly injured. But he was found by S.H.I.E.L.D. and S.H.I.E.L.D. gave him cybernetic parts. And that's why he is a cyborg technically. Either way right now it's Nick saying you and I are going to work together to hunt someone down. Very important. But getting back over to Black Widow and Songbird. Right now you do have the two characters trying to get away from the Thunderbolts. Because again... Over in the Thunderbolt series, where the storyline is also taking place in, you had Songbird actually attack the Thunderbolts. And of course, Black Widow had a saver, and so right now, these two characters are on the run while being chased by the Thunderbolts. And so, like in that storyline right there, in this one as well, they do go over to a secret shield base underneath some kind of football, baseball stadium. Either way, it is a hidden shield base. And when they arrive, they are confronted by Nick Fury. Now, like in that story there, though, Nick Fury told them, you made a mistake coming here because this area is actually not clear at all. And that is the moment you had the Thunderbolts blow the door down and say, hey, we found your base and we're here to capture you. And so getting into the second chapter for today's video, we actually do pick up right now with the Thunderbolts being able to actually capture Nick Fury, Black Widow, and Songbird. Now, with that being said, though, if you saw my video for the same storyline, but of course for the Thunderbolt side, you know what's about to happen next. Because that is the moment where you have Norman Osborn walk in. Now, you also probably wondering, how in the world do we have two Nick Furies at the same time and two different locations? Because we have one Nick Fury right now who's technically recruiting Jonathan Garrett. And we have this other Nick Fury right now who's been captured by the Thunderbolts. What in the world is going on? Well, you're going to see here in a moment. But if you saw my video when it came to the Thunderbolt side of the story, you know what's about to happen next. Because remember, once you have Songbird and Black Widow moved, 
to a different part of the base to be interrogated by the Thunderbolts, you have Nick Fury be confronted by Norman Osborn. Because let's not forget, earlier in the story, he was actually hired by Baron Von Strucker to find Nick Fury and to kill off Nick Fury. Because Nick has been ruining a lot of different operations for Hydra. And of course, you know what comes next. You have Nick shoot Nick Fury right in the head. Now that was huge over in the Thunderbolts book. But we come to find out that was never actually Nick Fury at all. And you're probably wondering, okay, did he use a life model decoy? Now, if you're new to Marvel Comics and you have no idea what life model decoys are, let me explain. So life model decoys are just robots that look so real that no one can tell it's actually a robot. And so a lot of times you have Nick Fury use a life model decoy as a way to take his place in different kinds of situations where he feels like he may be in danger. And so right now, you would think that this would be a life model decoy. But the thing is, it's not. Because once the robot body opens up, you have Phobos in there. And when he comes out, he came here to meet his father. Because Ares, the god of war, was there as well. Now, if you read the Thunderbolts book, Ares was not there. But if you read this book, Ares was actually there and so this is Ares right now being confronted by his son to have a very important conversation. But then we jump over to the real Nick Fury and Jonathan Garrett. Now when we do, of course right now they're having a meeting in the car. Now when it comes to this meeting, is Jonathan trying to figure out why in the world did Nick Fury call him up for? Because they have not seen each other in a very long time. And when it comes to Jonathan, he knows if Nick calls you up, it has to be something very important, but it has to be hush hush. And of course, when it comes to being hush hush, that means that you might run into a lot of trouble. And so right now, it's Nick saying, I want you to have a meeting with someone known as Seth Waters. Now, Seth Waters used to work for S.H.I.E.L.D. So did Jonathan Garrett. But you have Nick say, hey, Seth Waters came after you left S.H.I.E.L.D. Either way, it's Nick saying, I believe that he's actually part of HYDRA because when I was attacking the Hydra base, I found his name, and he was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Come to find out, this man the entire time was actually working for Hydra. And so that means that this man was probably feeding Hydra information about S.H.I.E.L.D. We don't know. Either way, it's Nick saying, I need you, Jonathan, to have a meeting with him and see if he is Hydra or possibly just it was a mistake and he's actually a good guy and wants to work for S.H.I.E.L.D. once again. But then you have Jonathan realize there's something more to the story. And when Nick tells him there is and says that it's going to be like the old times, you have Jonathan show that he's kind of upset but understand what he has to do. But unfortunately, we're not able to actually learn what Nick means by that because we jump back over to our other situation that's going on right now underneath the football stadium, that old shield base. But on the outside, we kind of find out that Hellfire and also Eden, better known as Manifold, were watching the place just in case Phobos did need their help. And of course, with things kind of popping off, you have Hellfire Eden say, Okay, it's probably best for us to go ahead and go in there and save him because if we don't, things could just get only worse. And honestly, I do not want to get yelled at by Nick Fury if something happens to the kid. So let's go inside and make sure the kid is actually okay. Now remember, when it comes to Manifold, and we've seen him a lot of times in our coverage over different things that Jonathan Hickman has done over the years in Marvel Comics, but he has the ability to actually teleport across the universe. Now, at this moment, it's not that powerful, but later on, it will become very powerful. But right now, you have Manifold and Hellfire say, let's get inside there and save the kid before he's killed off by Norman, or possibly his father, Ares, the God of War. 
And so that is the moment where we actually do pick up with Eden and Hellfire being able to actually sneak up behind Ares, the God of War, Norman Osborn, and Hawkeye. Now, this is not really Hawkeye. This is actually Bullseye. And what I mean by that is when he came to the Dark Avengers, Norman gave every single bad guy on the team the ability to pretend to be someone else in Marvel Comics. So Hawkeye was pretending, sorry, Bullseye was pretending to be Hawkeye. You had Venom pretending to be Spider-Man. And for Norman, he was Iron Man, or better known as Iron Patriot. Either way right now, you do have Eden and Hellfire being able to come up from behind on Ares, the God of War, Bullseye in a Hawkeye outfit, and Norman Osborn. And apparently, when it comes to Phobos, he knew all of this was going to happen because apparently he's able to see possible futures. And this one was a possible future. And so he knew that Norman was going to be here. He knew that he'll be okay. But he also came here to say, back off, Dad. Because right now, between Ares and Phobos, there's bad blood. And apparently, Ares had made a deal with Norman to get his son back away from Nick Fury. And so right now, you have Phobos saying, no, back off, I'm okay, and honestly, I don't like you. And the reason why you have Phobos so upset with Ares, the god of war, because Ares had actually joined the Dark Avengers and is working for this madman, Norman Osborn. And then you have Phobos tell Norman, you're gonna fail. Literally, your time is about to come. You are going to fail as a leader. All of this you build, hammer, and being in charge of Homeland Security is going to go away very soon. And when it does, you're going to go insane. Meaning that you're going to turn back into the Green Goblin. Now, you do have Ares stop Hawkeye from killing anyone in the room because he liked the idea of what his son did. His son showed some kind of courage. And so he does tell Hawkeye and Norman, let them go, let them leave. And of course, they begin to leave the place. Hellfire, Phobos, and Eden. Now that right there upsets Norman a lot because he says, I don't care if he's your kid or not. I am going to kill him and all his friends for attacking me and making me look bad. But then we pick up with the rest of the Secret Warriors back at their base. And right now we do see Daisy Johnson wanting to check up on Yo-Yo Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Had a hard time saying that. Either way, though, remember, when it came to Yo-Yo in our last storyline, she actually got injured. And because she was injured, she lost both of her arms. And so they had to give her cybernetic arms to use temporarily. Now, of course, she has just woken up from her coma and she wants to go back into battle. Where you do have Daisy Johnson, the leader of the team, tell her, we are not going back into battle anytime soon. Matter of fact, you need to rest because what you just went through, losing both your arms, is not something so easy to move on from. Now, that is the moment you do have the alarms go off. And the reason why the alarms are going off, because that is the moment you do have the rest of the secret warriors find out that Phobos, Eden, and Hellfire are trying to run for their lives because of being attacked by Hammer, the Dark Avengers, and probably the Thunderbolts as well. And so that is the moment where we actually do jump into the final chapter. Now, when we do, we actually pick up with Hellfire, Eden, and also Phobos trying to escape the S.H.I.E.L.D. base. Now, while they're trying to escape, you do have Hellfire ask Eden, Hey man, listen, if you have the power to teleport, then why haven't you got us out of here yet with your ability? And of course, you have Eden say, when it comes to my ability to actually teleport, it comes down to math. Meaning that it's very easy for me, myself, to teleport, but once I'm trying to do something bigger, let's say our group, I have to do more math to figure out how I'm going to do it and take us where. And on top of that, I have to see outside world. Right now, there's no windows. There's literally only one door right now that we're going to as our way out. 
and we get out there, I may be able to teleport, but again, it all comes down to math. I have to think about it and break it down to hopefully get us out of here. Now, down the road, that is going to change because he'll become very powerful down the road where he can just do it just like that. Either way, when they do get outside, that is the moment they're confronted by, of course, Norman Osborn, Ares, the God of War, and a whole bunch of Hammer agents who are right now here to technically fight against Phobos, Eden, and Hellfire. And so getting over to the rest of the Secret Warriors, we do see them right now technically watching the screen. And they're watching their friends in danger right now, which tells them, okay, we have to go help our team out right now because technically they're in danger. And so we have to get there hold off Hammer long enough in Norman Osborn so that Eden will be able to actually think of some math equation where he'll be able to teleport all of us back here safely. But on top of that, you have our heroes find out that the shield base where Eden, Phobos, and Hellfire are at right now is set to explode in five minutes. Norman Osborn has set off the self-destruct button. And so in five minutes, that place is going to blow up. And so they have to move fast. And so that is the moment where we actually do pick up where a huge battle does happen between some members of the Dark Avengers, but also the Secret Warriors. They're fighting against one another. And as they fight against one another, you do technically have this countdown happening. And of course, this countdown is just five minutes long. And so the secret warriors have to keep fighting until Eden is able to actually figure out a math problem so that he'll be able to actually teleport everyone out of there safely before they are captured by Norman Osborn or possibly killed off by Norman Osborn. And so as this countdown is going on, we do see that Eden is able to actually figure out some kind of math problem. But on top of that, we do get some very interesting matchups in this huge battle between the two teams. Either way, as the countdown finally reaches zero, the secret warriors are actually able to escape. And so is Norman Osborn and his, well, not all of his agents, but at least some of his agents are able to escape before the building blows up. Now, it does seem like Ares, the god of war, was actually... Uh, capture in the explosion and could possibly be dead but getting back over to jonathan garrett right now meeting up with seth waters this right now seems like two people who work in two different departments when it comes to serving the city in some kind of way like for example giving the city energy or possibly water it does seem like these two characters are just meeting gut to talk about the idea that their two offices should be able to communicate better with one another. But in reality, it's really more of Jonathan trying to figure out if Seth is actually an Hydra agent. And of course, while their meeting is going on, you have Seth say, hey man, listen, let's cut the you know what. I know that you're not actually here to help me. You're here to see if I'm actually an Hydra agent. And yes, I am. But the thing is, you forgot. We're so powerful. I knew who you were as soon as you walked into my building. I know that you're ex-Shield, but I also know that you're working for Nick Fury. So go tell Nick Fury that if he tries to take down Hydra, it's not going to be that easy because Hydra is so powerful and I'm part of Hydra, which means that I'm also as powerful as they are. And so that was a warning for Jonathan to give over to Nick Fury. Now, for Seth Waters, he believes that Nick Fury is going to be somewhat scared to his boots or whatever. But, of course, we know Nick Fury is not going to be scared that easily. Because as soon as you have Jonathan go back to Nick, and you have Jonathan give Nick confirmation that, hey, listen, when it comes to Seth Waters, he is actually part of Hydra. So we should most likely take him down and use him as a way to take down Hydra. And of course, you have Nick agree to that idea right there. And so getting into the final chapter for today's video, we actually do pick up right now with the Secret Warriors right now just trying to recover from their last battle. Now, while they're trying to fix their wounds, 
that is the moment you do have some characters feel bad for Phobos because it does seem like his father was actually trapped inside the explosion, which means that Ares, the god of war, could be dead. But then that is the moment you do have Phobos say, listen, my father is the god of war and I know my father. He's not dead. There's no way he died that easily in that explosion, which means that he is actually alive. And with him being alive, that means right now, sooner or later, he'll come after me and us down the road. Either way, I should be ready to see my father again down the road because I know he's not dead. And of course, we do get this glimpse to see that Ares, the god of war, is not dead. He does rise out of the breeze to show us that he is okay. But with that being said, though, this. Okay, so to continue our coverage over Secret Warriors, we actually do pick up with Dark Reign the List Secret Warriors. Now, this is technically a one-shot that was part of a series of one-shots that Marvel had released in the middle of Dark Reign. Now, the whole point of the List storylines were technically about Norman Osborn going after certain characters that he felt like should be arrested. Because remember, in Dark Reign, Norman Osborn was in charge of Homeland Security into protecting America. But on top of that, there were characters out there he felt like they were a threat to America that had to be arrested. And one of those characters is Nick Fury. Because at this point in Marvel Comics, Nick Fury was technically on the run for breaking a lot of laws in an earlier storyline. Either way, when it comes to this storyline right here, is Nick Fury still trying to handle a certain problem? And that problem is Hydra. Because we have to remember that Nick Fury found out that S.H.I.E.L.D. this entire time up to this moment in Marvel Comics was being controlled by Hydra. And so it's him right now saying, okay, you know what? For me to finally get rid of Hydra, I have to do different things here and there that will hurt Hydra in the long run and then finally defeat them. And so getting into today's storyline, we actually do pick up right now with Nick Fury about to sneak into Stark Tower. Now, Stark Tower was originally owned by Tony Stark. Now, the problem is, though, with this being Dark Reign, Norman Osborn actually had replaced Tony when Tony was the person in charge of Homeland Security. And so when Tony lost that role to Norman, he also lost Stark Tower to Norman as well. And so this is Nick right now sneaking into Stark Tower to actually find Norman Osborn to ask him for help. Now, while you have Nick Fury trying to find the room of Norman Osborn, he does run into Ares, the God of War. Now, when it comes to Ares, the God of War, we have to remember that he's technically part of the Dark Avengers, but on top of that, his son, Phobos, is actually part of Nick Fury's Secret Warriors team. Either way right now, it is Nick and Ares apparently making a deal with one another. And we will learn about that deal down the road. But then you have Nick continue on to find Norman Osborn. Now, when Nick does find Norman, at first, is Norman very confused on two things. One, how in the world did Nick get inside his tower? And two, why in the world would the most wanted man in America come to the man in charge of Homeland Security? What in the world is going on right now? And it's Nick telling Norman, I need your help. Now, you have Norman tell Nick, you're on my list. And remember, the list is apparently a list of people that Norman wants to arrest so badly. And you have Nick tell Norman, I don't really care. Right now, you and I must work together to actually figure something out and also accomplish something very big. And so that is the moment where you do have the story switch over to the U.S. Department of Treasury, where we actually pick up with Seth Waters. Now, Seth Waters is actually someone that Nick Fury was watching very closely in our last video. 
because he felt like when in Kenneth Waters, he had some connections to Hydra. Now remember, Nick Fury found out that Hydra was this entire time was controlling S.H.I.E.L.D. And so right now, Nick Fury believes that Seth Waters, who used to be part of S.H.I.E.L.D., was probably one of the people in S.H.I.E.L.D. who was leaking information over to Hydra. And so right now, you do have a bunch of Hammer agents come into his office and take Seth Waters in for questioning. And so that leads us into Norman Osborn actually interrogating Seth Waters. Now, Nick is also there as well, but Nick is technically staying on the sideline and hiding behind the mirror. And the reason why, because it's Nick and Norman not wanting Seth Waters to know that Nick is actually there so that Seth could possibly tell Norman everything he needs to know. Now, you do have Norman try his best to actually scare Seth Waters, but you have Seth show us that he's a man who doesn't get scared so easily. Either way, that is the moment you have Seth bring up the device that uh, Hammer Agents found in his office. Now, when it came to that device, apparently they were unable to actually hack into it. And you have Seth say, listen, that device is so protected, there is no way you'll be able to actually hack into it. And so any piece of information that you're looking for on that device, good luck, you won't be able to actually access it. Now, that is the moment you have Norman ask Seth, do you work for Hydra? Now, you would think he'll say yes, but he doesn't say yes. Matter of fact, he says a different name. He says Leviathan. Now, we have no idea what that means. This is technically a new group at this point in Marvel Comics coming in the first time. And apparently, it's another secret group out there causing problems for the world. Now, as soon as Nick hears that, he tells someone, do it now. And so that is the moment we kind of find out that apparently Nick brought a sniper with him. And the reason why? To take out Seth. And so with that happening, Seth dies, but the reason why Nick did that so that Seth won't be able to tell Norman Osborn anything else about what's going on with this new Leviathan group. Either way, you have Nick then begin the process of actually trying to get out of Stark Tower to then get away from Norman Osborn because Nick is technically still on the run. He's technically most wanted in America. Now, we kind of find out that his sniper was actually John Garrett. And we met John Garrett in our last video. Either way, you have Nick being able to get out of Stark Tower, get into his flying car with John Garrett, and they begin to fly away. Now, you do have Ares, the God of War, send a message to Nick by throwing an axe into his car by telling Nick, you still owe me a favor. And of course, we're going to see that favor down the road. Either way, you do have Nick and John being able to actually get away. And so that is the moment where we actually jump over to Nick and John being able to go back to their secret base. Now, when they get back to their base, this actually leads into Nick telling us that he was able to steal the hard drive from Norman Osborn and the Hammer Agents, the same hard drive that was found in Seth Waters' office. Either way, when it comes to this hard drive, it's holding a lot of information about Leviathan. Now, we were told earlier that apparently by Seth Waters, this hard drive is so hard to hack into. But of course, with Nick, nothing is hard for him to break into or hack into. And so he was able to hack into the hard drive. Now, when he does that, that is the moment he begins to learn a little bit more about Leviathan. And that is the moment he comes to find out that they have many secret bases across the world. But on top of that, something called the Great Wheel. And the Great Wheel has a list of names of different people who belong to different groups, like Nick Fury or Baron Von Strucker, who belongs to Hydra. And this right here kind of tells us that there is a possibility that Leviathan may have their hands in different organizations across the Earth. 
including S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA, and probably many more. Now, when it comes to the Great Wheel and all their names on the Great Wheel, each name is technically representing a zodiac sign. And so that means every single zodiac sign is being used by a particular person. Now, we only have a few names on this list. Some names are still unknown. But as we go through our coverage over Secret Warriors, we might learn more of those names down the road. Either way, this is where we are going to end today's comic book video. I know it's short, but honestly, it's a one shot to kind of give us more information about what's to come down the road in later video. So getting into today's video, we actually pick up with Nick Fury. Now, when we do, it's Nick Fury right now waking up Daisy Johnson. Remember, Daisy Johnson is technically the field leader for Secret Warriors. She actually works for Nick Fury, but out in the field, she's the one who calls the shot. But apparently, it's Nick right now telling her they're going on some kind of trip. So get up and let's get ready to go. And so that is the moment where we do jump over to the home of Silver Samurai. Now, when it comes to Silver Samurai, the last time we saw him was back in volume one, where he was giving away a box. Now, we had no idea what is inside the box, but apparently the box was holding a very special item, and he gave the box over to Viper. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up the box right now, because in his own house, he's being attacked right now by a group of people that actually work for Leviathan. They're just a bunch of henchmen. Either way right now, they came to his house looking for the box. But of course, once they're able to actually defeat him and read his mind, they realize that the box is no longer in his possession, which is correct because right now the box is with Viper, one of the five big bosses of Hydra. And so you can tell they're very upset about the idea that the box is not here with him anymore. Now that is the moment where we actually do jump over to Gorgon and Viper. Now when we do, of course we have to remember that these two characters are both bosses when it comes to Hydra. They're both two of the five bosses of Hydra. Either way right now, you do have the two characters right now talking about one of their new projects, the Dreadnought Medusa. And apparently it's a very special project that's going to help them out in their war against other people who are trying to stop them. Now, while you have the two characters actually talking to one another, you then have Viper realize that what Gorgon wants, that Gorgon wants war. Like he wants to go to war against all his enemies and actually defeat them. Now, when it comes to Viper though, Gorgon realized that she does not want war. And matter of fact, she tells him no. I don't want war, I want more for my destiny. Now, you would think that that line right there is a throwaway line, but honestly, it's not a throwaway line. That line right there is going to be very important for this storyline. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this book, actually. Now, after Viper and Gorgon had their conversation, you didn't have Gorgon actually call one of his servants to his room. Now, of course, this may seem like he wants to have some alone time with this servant because it's just him and her going to his private room. And matter of fact, at first, when I saw this section, I actually thought that. Either way, when they do go into his private room, well, that is the moment she realized that there are a lot of statues in the room. But also, these statues are women. Now, guys, we have to remember that when it comes to Gorgon powers, if you look into his eyes, you're basically turned to stone. And so right now, that means these other statue figures are past women who were invited into his private room, and then he just turned to stone. And so when it comes to this new servant, who at first thought that she's going to have some alone time with Gorgon, well, that is the moment he reveals his eyes to her, and of course, she looked into his eyes, and now she's been turned into stone. Now, after that, that is the moment he does look at a blade. Now, this blade is actually very important because it kind of goes back into his origin story, but also how he was able to join Hydra six years ago. 
And so that is the moment where we actually do jump back six years ago. Now, when we do, we actually pick up with Gorgon right now being confronted by Commander Kraken. Now, remember, in the present day, Kraken is actually another leader of Hydra as well, along with Gorgon and Viper. Either way, when it comes to Kraken, he's right now coming to actually talk to Gorgon about joining Hydra. Now, when Kraken arrived at the home of Gorgon six years ago, Gorgon apparently had used his own powers on his own family. And so his entire family had been turned to stone. Now, you do have Gorgon tell Kraken that if he feels like Kraken's here to kill him or possibly hurt him, who does the same thing to Kraken like he did to his family. Except that is the moment you have Kraken say, you can try that, but you will fail because my helmet prevents your powers from actually working on me. But the real reason why I'm here is to give you something very important. And so that is the moment we do see Kraken actually give Gorgon a blade, a blade known as the God Killer. And apparently the reason why it's called the God Killer because it killed kings, emperors, and made a god bleed. Either way, it's a way for Kraken saying, listen, you need this blade to build your destiny. I'm not trying to stop your destiny. I'm trying to help you reach your destiny. And so that was the moment where Gorgon had actually joined Hydra. And so back in the present day, when we saw him look at a blade, that blade was the god killer blade that was given to him by Kraken. And so that is the moment where you do have Jonathan Hickman remind us about Yo-Yo. Remember, Yo-Yo is one of the members of Secret Warriors, but she got badly injured in one of our first storylines. Matter of fact, she lost both of her arms. Now, with that being said, she was in a coma, but even then she was also in recovery and also getting robotic arms. Now, because she was in recovery, she was unable to actually communicate with her mother. And so right now we see Yo-Yo and Stonewall going to see her mother because her mom is probably so worried about her daughter because she has not heard from her daughter in who knows how long. Now, Yo-Yo is scared to go see her mom because now she has robotic arms. But it's Stonewall saying, listen, you should go see your mom because you have not actually talked to her in so long. But on top of that, she may be very concerned about your robotic arms, but at least she'll know that her daughter is still alive. Now, Yo-Yo does agree to do this, but only if Stonewall goes to see his father as well. Problem is though, his father is actually in prison. And matter of fact, we are going to learn who is his father down the road in this video. And so that is the moment where we actually jump back over to Gorgon. Now, the reason why, because remember, there is Leviathan out there right now, and apparently they're trying to look for the box. Now, they already attacked Silver Samurai, but after that, they did go over to the base that belongs to Gorgon, the Hydra base. Now, of course, they're going there to also look for more clues about the box, because they believe that they'll be able to actually take on Gorgon. And so when they do arrive at his Hydra base, and of course, they do locate him, He's not scared at all. And matter of fact, he welcomes the challenge. He's all like, please bring it on so I can just cut you guys down left to right and make y'all bleed because y'all made a huge mistake coming into my place. So let's go right now. And so that is the moment where we actually do jump over to Nick Fury and Daisy Johnson finally again. Now remember, apparently they were going on some trip and we come to find out their trip was to go to a secret base, which is called Hotspot, secret base number 13. Now when it comes to this base, that is the moment you have Daisy Johnson being introduced to two new characters that she has not met yet, Dum Dum Dugan and Olivia Hooks. Now those two characters honestly are not that important. It's the next two characters that are actually very important which will be Alexander Pierce and also Mikkel, Nick Fury's son. Now, the reason why these two characters are actually very important is because these two characters right now, they run other groups like Daisy does, other groups of secret warriors. And right now, they all been assigned to do different things. But it's Nick saying, your three groups, Daisy, Alexander, and Mikkel, it's time to bring y'all groups together 
because right now a huge storm is coming and I need all hands on deck for this huge storm. Now that is the moment where we actually do jump back over to Gorgon. Now when we do jump back over to Gorgon, he's right now still fighting against the forces of Leviathan. Now while fighting against them, that is also the moment where you do have the group of Leviathan actually give us more information about their group. And apparently right now their bosses, their masters as they call them, are right now asleep. And apparently they have been asleep for a very long time. But sooner or later, they're going to wake up. And the reason why they're here right now attacking this Hydra base is to one, get the box, but two, also gain information about this new world from the mind of Gorgon. Because when their masters wake up, they're going to wake up to a new world, a whole brand new kind of society. Now with that being said, Gorgon's kind of like, no, you will not take anything out of my head at all. And of course, he does kill every single one of them in his room. Now as soon as he does that, he realized, wait a second, I'm not the only person on this base right now. There's also Viper as well. And the problem is though, when he does realize that and runs down to see if Viper is okay, Viper has now been kidnapped by Leviathan and they fly away. And so now one of the five Hydra bosses has been kidnapped and taken away by this new evil group. Now that is the moment where we actually jump back over to Yo-Yo and Stonewall. Now with that being said, remember, when it came to Yo-Yo earlier in the video, she had to go see her mother. Now that was part of a deal between these two characters. And so because she actually did that, now Stonewall has to go see his father. The thing is though, like I said earlier, his father is in prison. And so of course they have to go to that prison so that he'll be able to actually meet his father. Now with that being said though, when it comes to Stonewall, He's one of the characters we had no idea where he came from. And what I mean by that is, when it came to Secret Warriors, literally every single character that was brought in by Daisy and Nick, apparently those characters had a connection to another Marvel character in some kind of way. But when it came to Stonewall, we had no idea who was his connection. Where did his powers come from? And we come to find out, they come from the Absorbing Man. He is the father of Stonewall. Now we do have another flashback. As a matter of fact, we do jump back six years in the past. Now when we do, this is a way for us to actually learn about the origin of Hive because Hive is another boss of Hydra. Now when it comes to Hive, we're still kind of left wondering more information about his past but we do learn that when it comes to Hive, apparently he was recruited because he was a weak body person, but it made him the perfect host for some kind of parasite that was produced by Kraken. And so once the parasite was able to actually attach onto the young man's body, of course, that person evolved and he turned into the creature we have today in the present day, the Hive, one of the five bosses of Hydra. And so getting back to the present day, we actually do pick up with the rest of the Hydra bosses right now meeting up. And the reason why they're meeting up right now is all because of Viper being kidnapped. But on top of that, because somehow Leviathan was able to access Gorgon's Hydra base, which is something that should not happen so easily. And so right now it's Gorgon saying, we have a traitor in our group someone high up in the ranking, possibly one of us. But the question is right now, who? Who is the traitor? And so right now you have each boss try to say, no, it's not me, but of course you can't believe that. And so you have Kraken say, you know what? I have the best idea. I am going to use our psychics to read our minds to figure out who is the traitor. And once they do that, we'll find out who is actually the person right now betraying our organization. Now that is the moment where we do jump back over to Nick, Alexander, Mikkel, and also Daisy. Now when we do, it's Nick right off the bat saying that this meeting right now between all three groups is going to be a one-time thing. Just in case there's some kind of breach down the road, 
the other groups will not be affected at all. Now, with that being said, he wants each group right now, each leader of each group to right now share their information about their assignment. Now, when it comes to Daisy, honestly, she has no information to actually share. And the reason why, because her team is more of the attack team, and that is why. Now, with that being said, we come to find out that when it comes to Pierce, apparently he was assigned, his team was assigned, to look for different Hydra bases. And of course, he did find a few of them. Now, when it comes to Mikkel, his assignment was to get any kind of information about Leviathan. The problem is, though, he can't find anything at all. Like, once he gets one small clue, and try to follow that clue to hopefully get more information about Leviathan, it leads into a dead end. Now, that is the moment you have Nick kind of give us the idea of what Leviathan is actually is. Now, that is the moment where you do have Nick try to explain that when it comes to Hydra, Hydra is technically the leftover pieces of Imperial Japan, but also the fastest of Germany. Now, that is actually Hydra. But when it comes to Leviathan, they are technically the leftover pieces of the Soviet Union. Now, the problem is, though, when it came to Leviathan, they had 100,000 agents. But then one day, they all just disappeared just like that, gone. And no one knows what exactly happened to them. But then we jump over to one of the bases of Leviathan. Now, when we do, we actually see the leader of this group right now trying to get more information about the box out of Viper. Now, when it came to Viper, she did get the box from Silver Samurai, but she then hand the box over to Madam Hydra, another boss in the Hydra group. And so with that being said, she has no idea where the box is actually yet. Now, when it comes to this leader, he's very upset about the idea that their plans right now are being delayed left and right. And so to kind of move their plans along a tad bit faster, he tells his henchmen, okay, you know what? It's time to wake the beast. And that is the moment we kind of find out that this base is holding so many different members of Leviathan and some kind of containers. And of course, they're kept in stasis, which means that when Nick Fury said there were 100,000 agents, they all disappeared one day and no one knows where they went to, bam, they're right here right now. They are all kept in this base right now in some kind of stasis. But now they're being waken up into the new world to begin the process of actually taking over the new world. Now, getting into the third chapter, that is the moment where we actually pick up with Nick Fury right now on his jet as he talks to Dum Dum Dugan. Now, right now, it's just Nick telling Dugan that he's going to use one of his special teams as a way to back up the Howling Commandos, the private military team that Dugan runs. Now, right after that conversation, we do see Dugan talk to some other characters right now about the idea that if they actually trust Nick Fury's plan. Now, they do trust his plan. The problem is, though, they're afraid that his plan could cause an international incident, which could cause a lot of problems for other countries around the world. Now, that is the moment where we do jump back over to Nick Fury. Now, when we do, we do see Nick right now be confronted by Daisy. And the reason why, because right now, Daisy is actually very upset with Nick. Now, the reason why she's upset with Nick right now, because Nick actually told her that she needs to remove a certain person off her team. And of course, that would be Drood. Now, the reason why he is saying that, because he feels like Drood is not ready to be a hero at all. Matter of fact, he feels like Drood could most likely be the reason why somebody might get hurt down the road or innocent people could possibly die. And so it's Nick telling her, you need to remove him off your team now. But she says no, because this is my team. When we're out in the field, I'm in charge. And I feel like I know who's right with the team or who's not right for the team. And right now, I feel like Drood is still great for the team, no matter what you say. And so, no, I am going to keep him on the team. Now, Nick is going to agree with her, but he does tell her, listen, you're going to realize I'm right when someone gets seriously hurt down the road. And when that happens, that's going to realize that you should have listened to me. 
Now that is the moment where we do jump over to Madame Hydra and also Gorgon. Now remember, when it comes to Madame Hydra, she's one of the bosses of Hydra as well. But right now, you're having her leave the Hydra base. Now that is a huge no-no. And the reason why, because she was not clear to actually leave yet. And the reason why I'm saying that, because remember, what Kraken said earlier, right now, he is going to use the psychic team as a way to read the minds of every single boss of Hydra to make sure nobody is actually a traitor at all. But Madame Hydra has not been cleared yet. And so it does seem very sketchy that right now she is trying to leave. And the Gorgon, he wants to know if he should actually stop her or let her go. But what she tells Gorgon is that she feels like right now they're wasting time doing these tests. Because the longer Viper is held by them, the more their secrets could get out. And so it's her saying, no, I need to go find Viper to keep our plans in secret. So goodbye, Gorgon, and good luck. Now that is the moment where we do get another flashback. Now, when it comes to this flashback, we actually do pick up right now with Baron Von Strucker on Hydra Island. Of course, an island that belongs to him. Now with that being said, right now we do see Baron Von Strucker having dinner with his children. Now, while they're having dinner, that is the moment you have Kraken appear. Now, this established that when it comes to Baron Von Strucker and Kraken, they are very close friends. Now, with that being said, though, Kraken is right now coming to Baron Von Strucker with some sad news. Right now, it's Kraken telling Baron Von Strucker, hey man, listen, I'm dying. Like, sooner or later, I'm going to die. That is my sad news. Now, for Baron Von Strucker, he can't believe that his old friend is actually going to die. But either way, he does tell his dear friend, before you die, we are going to accomplish our goals, especially the one where we killed off Nick Fury. Now, that is the moment where we do jump over to Nick and Daisy arriving back to the home base of the Secret Warriors. Now, when they do that, of course, that is the moment where they do debrief the rest of the team about everything about Hydra and also Leviathan. Now, with that being said, that is also the moment where you have Nick tell the team that, listen, in your bedrooms, there are going to be some very special instructions, and I need you guys to follow those instructions because those instructions are going to tell you how you're going to travel to the, our next mission spot. So make sure you pack your clothes up, but also grab that paper and follow the directions on the paper. And so you have each member go to the room, they get their clothes, but they also get that paper. Now here comes the problem though, Drood. Because when it comes to Drood, Nick said, sorry Drood, you're off the team. Go home, you can't be a good hero, a good fit for this team. Now this is going to be a huge problem. And the reason why, because Nick just told Daisy, fine. If you feel like Drood can stay on the team, then Drew can stay on the team. But now this is Nick saying, nope, I'm sorry, I lied. It's my team, my decision, and I feel like Drood should be off the team. And matter of fact, he is off the team. Bye bye Drood, just like that. And so that is the moment where we do jump over to Madam Hydra. Now when we do, we come to find out that Madam Hydra is actually a traitor. She's working for Leviathan, which honestly, it was so obvious. Either way though, when she does arrive, Viper cannot believe that Madame Hydra is the traitor. But on top of that, Madame Hydra is about to give Leviathan the one thing they've been looking for in this entire storyline. And of course, it is the box. And so now, she can hand over the box and say, listen, this proves that I'm trying to work with you guys. I am part of Leviathan. And this just got a tad bit crazier. And so that is the moment where we jump into the fourth chapter. Now, when we do, we actually do pick up with Nick Fury right now and Daisy having that conversation about the idea that Nick just let go of Drood. Now, to Daisy, she's very upset because we saw earlier, Nick gave her the ability to make the decision on Drood. And she said, because I'm field leader, I feel like he should stay on my team. He's a great fit for my team. And Nick said, fine, I will listen to you. 
But as we saw in the last chapter, Nick didn't do that. He went behind her back. And so right now it's her saying, why did you do that? And Nick said, listen, when I gave you the ability to make that big time decision, I was really hoping you'll make the right one. Of course, you made the wrong one. And so I had to step in because Drew could get someone hurt down the road or possibly innocent people hurt down the road. And so I had to step in before things got bad down the road. Now, once Nick leaves, you can see how angry Daisy is. And this could begin a rift between the two characters. Now, with that being said, that is the moment you have Hellfire come in. And when Hellfire comes in, you have Hellfire say, listen, you know what? Let me take you for a drink because right now you need one. But then we jump back over to Leviathan base. Now, when we do, of course, we do pick up where we left off at last time with this group where right now you have Madam Hydra handing over the box to Leviathan. Now, here comes the big thing because Viper realized that Madam Hydra is a traitor, that Madam Hydra is working with Leviathan. But on top of that, it's Madam Hydra saying, Viper, listen, you have no idea. I was never close to you or anyone else when it came to Hydra. As a matter of fact, I never truly cared for Hydra. Hydra was just a tool for me to use to help out my organization, Leviathan. Now, with that being said, though, that is also the moment where you have Madam Hydra pull a gun out and shoot and kill Viper. Viper dies just like that. And then you have Madam Hydra say, I'm no longer Madam Hydra. You may call me Contessa Valentina. And remember, Contessa Valentina is an old lover of Nick Fury. So Nick has no idea that Contessa has been working for Hydra, but he definitely does not know that she's also working for the Leviathan as well. When he does find out, it's going to be a whole lot of mess. Now, that is the moment where we do jump back 15 years in the past. Now, when we do, we actually pick up with a younger Contessa. Now, right now, we do see Contessa about to hang out with her parents. The problem is, though, there was an explosion. And with that explosion, of course, it killed off her parents. Now, two days later, we do see her at a church crying about the death of her parents. But while doing that, well, that is the moment she is confronted by a mysterious man. Now, we have no idea who this guy is, but we do know that Contessa does know him very well. And same for her, he knows her very well. Either way right now, you have the guy come to Contessa, and as soon as she sees him, she wonder where was he yet? And the reason why, because of paperwork. Because that is the moment we kind of find out she had to do paperwork on her parents because her parents were undercover agents. Now, we have no idea for who, but apparently they were. And so this guy said, listen, I'm going to need you to carry on your parents' work. But if you do that, I promise you a very high rank in our future organization down the road. Oh, I also want to inform you, because now you're going to be an undercover agent, I'm going to need you to actually work for this American group, because I heard they're going to offer you something very big very soon. And he was right because a week later, dumb, dumb dude comes around. He's all like, hey, listen, I want you to join S.H.I.E.L.D. And so technically this entire time when Contessa was on S.H.I.E.L.D., she was actually a spy for this unknown organization. And again, it could have been Leviathan. We still have no idea. But now we know the entire time she was basically a traitor. Now, that is the moment where we actually jump over to Daisy and Hellfire having that drink. Now, while they're having that drink, of course, it gives Daisy the chance to actually express her feelings about Nick Fury and not in a positive way, more in a negative way, because honestly, she cannot stand the guy at all. Either way, though, while she's actually talking to uh, Hellfire about Nick Fury, well, that is the moment she wonders, hey, Hellfire, why is your name JT? What does JT stand for? And he tells her it's James Taylor. And of course, apparently his mom named him after some kind of big time rock band person, or whatever. Either way, that's the reason he's named JT or James Taylor. Now, that is the moment you have Daisy ask Hellfire, why are you still on the team? And he tells her the only reason why he's on the team, because of her. And this begins a love story between these two characters in this series now. 
But that is the moment where we do jump over to Contessa. Now, when we do, we actually see Contessa right now technically changing clothes. Now, when she does change clothes, it's a way to say that she's now going to show her true colors, to say that she has always been with Leviathan this entire time. Now, on top of that, that is the moment where you do have Contessa basically say, you know what? Let me tell you guys about Hydra. And of course, that is the moment she says, listen, when it comes to Hydra, their weapons are very advanced and that could be a huge problem. But the thing is, their recruitment numbers are very low. And so right now, Hydra is technically an easy target. Now, that is the moment you do also have Madam Hydra hand over the box. And when she does, we do see one of the members of Leviathan use the item inside the box to wake up one of the stasis tubes. And when they do that, of course, we get the actual leader of Leviathan, Orion. He walks out and says, okay, it's good to be back. It's good to be back in charge of my group. And so now Leviathan has one of their masters are their true master. Either way right now, you have Orion saying, it's time for us to attack Baron Von Strucker, but to also attack Nick Fury as well. And so you have Leviathan begin the attack on Nick Fury first, because that is the moment you have Nick Fury get a text from Contessa asking to have dinner. Now remember, when it comes to Contessa, she was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And matter of fact, she was a close ally of Nick Fury. But on top of that, when it comes to Contessa and Nick, well, they were lovers. And so, of course, when she texts, hey, let's have dinner, at first, it's Nick like, yeah, I'm down. It's the woman I love asking for food. Let's do it. But at the same time, though, he's kind of like, hmm, something seems very sketchy about this entire thing. But of course, he will go to the dinner. And so that is the moment where we jump into the fifth chapter. Now, when we do, that is the moment where we actually pick up with the Secret Warriors right now playing cards. Now, with them playing cards, of course, they have a conversation about the idea of bringing back Drood. Now, of course, when it comes to most of the team, they agree that they should bring back Drood. The problem is, though, they know they need Nick Fury's permission to actually do it. And that is the huge problem because Nick Fury is most likely going to say no. Now, that is the moment where you have Stonewall say, listen, y'all, I feel like Nick Fury has the potential to have us reach our full potential, but we have to begin to trust him. But on top of that, we have to start working like a family because that is our biggest problem. We're not working like a family. And with that right there, we could technically all die down the road because we're not actually bonding with one another. So we should actually change that right now. But then you have Daisy ask for a vote. Should they bring back Drood? Because if they get enough votes and it's yes, then it should go to Nick Fury and say, you need to bring back Drood. Now that is the moment where you have everybody vote. When everyone votes, Phobos disagrees. He says, listen, Drood was not a good fit at all. But on top of that, I know Nick Fury. He does not care what you guys think. You may all vote to bring him back in but Nick will still say no. And so it's Daisy right now saying, I'm going to prove you wrong, Phobos. Now that is the moment where we actually do see the Hydra bosses go to the base of Leviathan. Matter of fact, one of their bases. And the reason why I say one of their bases is because when the Hydra bosses actually arrive at that base, Leviathan is gone. They left the base behind. It's completely abandoned. On top of that, they left the dead body of Viper. And that right there is huge because now they know one of their own is dead. Now, with that being said, that is also the moment where they do find a message that was left behind for Baron Von Strucker. And the reason why, because we kind of find out Baron Von Strucker and Orion, they have some kind of connection between each other. Now, we have no idea what this connection is, but once the message is played, you have Orion say, it's about time for us to actually meet. And matter of fact, I'll meet you at the crown in three days from now. And so now we know that they're going to have some kind of big meeting. But the big question is, what is the connection between Baron Von Strucker and also Orion? 
Now that is the moment where we actually do pick up with the origin of Viper. So we go back in time and we kind of find out that when it comes to Viper at a very young age, she was actually recruited by Hydra. And matter of fact, they put young girls in these houses. There were eight houses and each house had 12 girls. But if you want to show Hydra that you were the best fit to join, you had to be every single girl in your house. And so at the end of the time for Viper, she was the last girl at her house. And of course, she did join Hydra and then she did move up the ranks. Now, we do also see other memories of Viper from her past. And honestly, most of them are not important for this storyline. But back in the present day, we actually do see Viper coming back to life because it seems like Hive was able to share a parasite to go inside her body to bring her back to life. But when she does come back to life, she says, no, do not call me Viper anymore. Call me Madam Hydra. I am now going to replace Contessa as Madam Hydra for the Hydra organization. Now, that is the moment where we actually jump back over to the dinner between Nick Fury and Contessa. Now, when it comes to this dinner, it's really more of Contessa doing what Leviathan had told her to do. Do something with Nick Fury. Now, that is the moment where she does bring out a lot of guys with guns, which, of course, does tell Nick, OK, this was supposed to be a trap. Now, to Contessa, she thinks she has Nick Fury right where she wants him. But this is Nick Fury. The dude is always prepared for almost anything. And so that is the moment you have Nick say, nope, here's my guys and their guns as well. And you have all these guys stand up and point their guns at Contessa and her fellow members of Leviathan to show that Nick Fury is always prepared. Now, of course, you do have both sides call a truce because they realize that not either side could technically win this battle. Now, while Nick leaves, he does tell Contessa one thing. He says, listen, I want you to remember that I bought you those flowers. And then he walks away. Now, that line right there could be a throwaway line, but knowing Jonathan Hickman, that line is going to be somewhat important. Now, that is the moment where we actually do jump back over to Nick Fury going back to the base of the Secret Warriors. Now, when he does arrive back at the base, of course, that is the moment where you have Daisy coming to him and saying, hey, man, listen, I feel like you made a huge mistake letting Drood go. Now, when it comes to Nick Fury, he feels like he never makes mistakes at all. And so he tells her once again, listen, Drood is off the team. It's final and I need you to wake up because I'm trying to get you ready for something big to come down the road. But unfortunately, you're too blind to actually see what I'm trying to do for you right now. And so when I say Drood is off the team, Drood is off the team and that is final. And you have Nick Fury just walk away. Now, that is the moment where we do see Daisy actually go tell the rest of the team that what Nick Fury just told her that Drood is off the team forever. Either way though, that is the moment where she does turn her attention over to JT, Hellfire. Now let's not forget, at the end of the last chapter, she told, or he told her, sorry, he told her that the only reason why he's on the team still, why he has not left the team yet, is because of her because he has feelings for her. And so this is her right now saying, I'm gonna take charge and see how much really do care for me. And so that is the moment we do see her actually kiss JT. And so this begins their relationship in this series. Now that is the moment where we actually jump into the final chapter. Now, when we do, we have to jump forward two weeks since the ending of the last chapter. And when we do, we actually pick up right now with Nick Fury meeting up with the team leaders of the three teams that he runs. So of course, Daisy, Mikkel, and also Alexander. But that is the moment where you do have Nick tell his team leaders, hey guys, listen, something big just happened. And what he means by that is, in the two week gap between the end of the last chapter and the beginning of this chapter, something big happened. And the question is right now, what happened in the two weeks gap? We don't know yet. 
Now that is the moment where you do have the story actually jump back 10 days in the past. Now when we do, we actually do pick up right now with the big meeting between Hydra, but also with Leviathan. Now with that being said, you only have the team leaders arriving to this meeting. So of course, you have Baron Von Strucker and you also have Kraken. Now. On the other side, you have Orion appearing, you also have Contessa, but you also have a character known as the Magadan. And I really hope I pronounced that correctly. Either way, the three leaders of Leviathan are here right now for the big meeting between Hydra and also Leviathan. Now, that is the moment where we actually do jump back in time even farther. Matter of fact, we jump back two years in time. And when we do, we actually pick up with the original Kraken. And of course, this Kraken is Daniel Whitehall. Now, here comes the big shocker because this man right now is laying in bed dying. And matter of fact, the only reason why he's still alive is because of the machines that are keeping him alive. But that is the moment he is confronted by a mysterious character. Now, this mysterious character is actually here because apparently... He read the journals of Daniel, and because of that, he now knows the true history of Daniel, Daniel being the original Kraken, but also knows how the armor actually works. And so our mysterious character actually grabs the helmet, puts it on, and he becomes the new Kraken of the Marvel Universe. But on top of that, he turns off the machines that are keeping Daniel alive. And so just like that, Daniel is now officially dead. But then we jump back to the point of time where we actually do see Hydra and also Leviathan having that meeting. Now, when it comes to their meeting, of course, the meeting does not go as planned because right off the bat, you do have both sides show that they actually hate one another. But on top of that, that is the moment where you actually have Orion tell Baron Von Strucker that he wants Hydra to actually fall in line, meaning that he wants Hydra to actually take orders by him. Now, of course, you have Baron Von Strucker say no. Now, right before a fight breaks out, that is the moment where you have Contessa realize that Viper is alive again. Matter of fact, she's shocked to see that Viper is alive again. But either way, because you have Baron Von Strucker tell Orion no about the idea of Hydra taking orders by Orion, it does lead into a big fight between both sides. And so back in the present day, that is the moment where we kind of find out that Nick Fury was telling all three team leaders about what happened between Hydra and also Leviathan. And he says that even though a war had broke out between two sides, no one actually died in the war. Meaning that when it comes to the team leaders of both sides, they both survived the big battle. But right now it's Nick saying this is the perfect time to actually attack. Because while both sides are right now trying to recover after their big battle between one another, it's the perfect time to actually take out both groups. And so right now it's Nick saying, all three teams get ready it's time for us to attack hydra but to also attack leviathan as well it's about to go down now because it was two weeks since the ending of the fifth chapter we do establish the idea that hellfire and daisy johnson are actually dating one another and so they are officially a couple now at this point in the storyline but this right here is going to be very crucial for later parts or later videos we're gonna do down the road. Now that is the moment where we do jump over to Nick Fury. Now when we do, we actually see Nick Fury right now with Dum Dum Dugan, James Garrett, and also a professor. We're not told who this guy is just yet, but either way right now, you do have all four men meeting up and discussing about something big to happen down the road. And of course, it's Nick Fury right now asking all three men are you okay with what we're about to do? Because if you're not, this is the best time to actually back out. And of course you have all three men agree with Nick Fury's future master plan. But this is where I'm gonna leave you guys on one heck of a cliffhanger. Because that is the moment where you actually have Hellfire, of course a new boyfriend of Daisy, get a text saying it's time to meet. And so that is the moment we come to find out that Hellfire goes to a bar. 
And when he goes to the bar, well, we find out that Homeboy is actually a traitor. He's working for Baron Von Strucker, which means that Nick Fury has no idea, or he might have an idea, that someone else on his team is actually a spy once again. Once again, Nick is being played by Hydra like he was his entire life. Either way, right now, this could cause a lot of problems down the road. But with So to get into today's storyline, we actually pick up at the UN. Now, when it comes to the UN, the United Nations, it's not going to be one of those big meetings where you have every single country involved in the UN coming to a meeting to talk about something very important. Instead, you're going to have select members from different countries coming to this one particular meeting. And this particular meeting is about the Howling Commandos. Because by this point in Marvel Comics, the Howling Commandos was not just your regular military team that did blackout works for the American government. Instead, when it comes to the Howling Commandos, they are a private military company. So that you could hire them to do different things as long as they're not breaking too many laws when it comes to other countries. Either way though, the Howling Commandos apparently did something really big in China recently. And so that is why we're having this meeting with some members of the United Nations. Because right now, they're going to discuss what happened over in China with two particular members of the Howling Commandos. And that will be Dum Dum Dugan and also uh, Jasper Sitwell as well. And these two guys have to answer for certain things the Howling Commandos did over in China. Now at first, when it comes to this meeting, you really do have the members of the United Nations, these few members of the United Nations, begin to ask Jasper and also Dum Dum Dugan a few questions about the Howling Commandos private military company. Because technically, they do have different contracts with different clientels. But on top of that though, they want to learn more about their different contracts, their different clients but especially one particular client or the person who could actually be in charge of the Howling Commandos. And of course, that would be Nick Fury because these guys know that Nick Fury worked with the Howling Commandos back in the day. I mean, literally, he was the leader of the Howling Commandos back in World War II and the Korean War as well. And so with these select members of the United Nations, they know that the Howling Commandos are technically working for Nick Fury to go after two particular groups, Leviathan and also Hydra. Either way, you don't have Dum Dum Dugan nor Jasper confirm what they're trying to figure out, that they actually work for Nick Fury, that the Howling Commandos is technically his small military group to do different things across the world. Either way, you do have Dum Dum Dugan bring up a particular get together saying that two weeks ago all the members of the howling commandos over the years and other people who have fought alongside the howling commandos came together to have one last drink together and those people were having a great time now you're going to see steve rogers there as well because with the howling commandos fighting back in World War II, they also fought alongside Steve Rogers, of course, Captain America. He was in World War II. Now you do have the select members of the United Nations try to bring the conversation back to what they actually want to talk about. And of course, what happened in China. And this is the moment where we actually learned what happened in China. And we kind of find out that the Howling Commandos and some teams of Nick Fury, they went into China to attack a particular Hydra base. Now, the reason why he's doing that is because he wants to shut down Hydra. And the reason why he wants to shut down Hydra is not really because they're bad guys. It's really more because when it came to Nick Fury, he found out that the entire time S.H.I.E.L.D. has been around, they have technically been controlled by Hydra. 
which explains why S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury were never able to actually shut down Hydra over the years because in reality they are being controlled by Hydra. Either way right now apparently the Howling Commandos and some teams of Nick Fury they went into China to shut down a Hydra base over there. And so that is the moment where we do get this flashback. Now, when it comes to this flashback, we do see select members of the Howling Commandos, including Dum Dum Dugan, but also one of Nick Fury's Caterpillar teams. Now, the reason why he calls them a Caterpillar team is because they are technically a group of characters that were put together that no one knew about. So, for example, when it came to the Secret Warriors, they're the same thing. They are a group of characters that no one knew about that was put together by Nick Fury to be his secret warriors team. But he also have other teams who are just like them out in the world. And so when it came to the attack on the Hydra base in China, he did have Dum Dum Dugan and also the Howling Commandos, but he also had one of his Caterpillar teams that was being led by Alexander Pierce. Now, the characters on his team are honestly not that important at all. It's just to remind us that he has different teams out there, Nick Fury does, to use for different kind of missions across the world. And so getting back to the present day, we actually do see the United Nations explain why they're so upset with the idea of the Howling Commandos going into China and attacking that Hydra base. And the reason why, because they technically went into that country illegally. They went into that country illegally. They battle against Hydra illegally in another country. They broke so many laws. And so that is why they're having this meeting right now when it comes to the United Nations. Now, here's the big thing though. You didn't have Dum Dum say, listen, China has no room to talk at all. And the reason why he's saying that because China technically knew about that Hydra base in their country. They knew that a terrorist group was attacking America, but did nothing to stop that terrorist group. And matter of fact, let them build a base in their own country. And so even though China is right now upset with the Howling Commandos coming into their country illegally, technically they're still at fault here because they were protecting a terrorist group. And matter of fact, you have Dum Dum point out the same for Russia because Russia had that Leviathan base as well, another terrorist group. And so right now it's Dum Dum saying, you cannot talk China nor Russia. You had terrorist groups attacking us, attacking America. That right there is a problem. Now, with that being said, you do have the members of the United Nations kind of ask Dum Dum and Jasper, are you guys done? Like, are you done technically, you know, going to other countries illegally? And you have Dum Dum say, well, it's kind of hard for us to do that where most of our men died in that battle in China against Hydra. The Howling Commandos are technically, quote unquote, dead. And so getting into the second chapter, you do have the UN Security Council kind of continue to ask Dum Dum Dugan and Jasper to repeat themselves. You're saying that when it comes to the Howling Commandos, that technically you guys are dead. Most of your men have died. And so with most of your men gone, there is no way you're able to actually continue on with the Howling Commandos. And now you don't have Dum Dum kind of agree with that statement, but at the same time, it's kind of like it's hard for us to do anything where technically most of our helicarriers are right now being held by China's government. But on top of that, you should ask China because China is withholding a lot of information from the rest of you guys. And so because of that, you don't know what actually went down when it came to the big battle between us and also Hydra. But on top of that, the reason why we cannot continue on, because right now they're holding on to a lot of helicarriers that we were using that went down in battle, but of course couldn't come back with us once the battle was done. And so with that being said, it seems like China is somewhat protecting Hydra in some kind of way. 
And so we do get a flashback where we are actually able to see the big battle between Hydra and also the Howling Commandos. And of course, this section does last for a few pages, but it is a way for us to actually see, you know, how big the battle was. Now, when it comes to a select group of the Howling Commandos, they were actually able to find a particular room. Now, when it comes to this particular room, apparently we couldn't find out that Hydra had a certain project going on where they were creating hive parasites. Now, remember, the original hive parasite did attach to a particular human, and that human did evolve into, of course, the hive we have today in Marvel Comics, one of the main bosses of Hydra. But now they're trying to create more high parasites as way to have more highs in their organization. Now, with that being said, though, you do have the Howling Commandos make sure that this little project cannot be completed at all. And so they do blow up the entire room with a bomb that they have brought with them. Now, we do jump back farther in time, and when we do, we actually do pick up with that meeting with the Howling Commandos before they had attacked that base in China. Now, when it comes to these members of the Howling Commandos at this meeting, of course, right now, it's really just them kind of sitting down and chatting about the old days, their battles in World War II, but also their battles in the Korean War. Now, with that being said, though, of course, they do bring up Steve Rogers because Steve Rogers was fighting alongside with them in World War II and different battles across the world. But on top of that, the reason why they're kind of talking about Steve Rogers and giving him a toast is because there were a lot of battles where the Howling Commandos should technically be dead. But of course, they got lucky because they had Steve Rogers there as Captain America to save the day. And so, of course, they do give him a toast. Now, we do get another flashback, but this flashback actually takes place after you had the Howling Commandos and one of Nick Fury's team attack the base in China, the Hydra base in China. Where right now, we actually pick up with Dum Dum Dugan on a helicarrier, but he's talking to Alexander Pierce. Now remember, Alexander Pierce is one of the leaders of the Caterpillar teams that Nick Fury has. But with that being said, right now, is Pierce kind of wondering how in the world was Nick able to find out about that Hydra base in China? Like, where did his intel come? Now, of course, you have Dum Dum Dugan not tell Alexander Pierce anything at all. Because when it comes to Nick Fury, he makes sure that when it comes to information, he is the only person to know about certain kind of information. But if he wants to share information with someone, it's going to be with Dum Dum Dugan. And technically, that's really it. And so right now, when it comes to Alexander Pierce, he hates the idea that technically he is not in the inner circle where Nick Fury can tell him a lot of different kinds of information about Hydra and also Leviathan. Instead, it's Nick right now giving Alexander just pieces of information that Nick does not mind to share with Alexander, but technically saying, you do not deserve to know everything I know, because what I know is only things I need to know. And so when it comes to Pierce, he does leave the helicarrier after talking to Dum Dum Dugan about the idea of how Nick was able to find out about that Hydra base in China. But of course you can tell that Pierce is kind of upset that he's not in the inner circle. Now, this actually leads us into to find out what happened to the helicarriers. And what I mean by that is, as soon as Alexander Pierce and his team left to go back to their base, and of course you had Dum Dum Dugan going back to their Howling Commandos base, well, that is the moment where they were attacked in midair on their helicarriers. They were attacked by Gorgon, one of the five bosses of Hydra. Technically, at this point, one of the four bosses of Hydra because the fifth boss actually left the group and betrayed them. Either way right now, you have Gorgon showing that he is very upset about the idea that the Howling Commandos had destroyed one of their Hydra bases, especially the one in China. 
Now, as we get into the third chapter of this storyline, we actually do pick up at the reunion of the Howling Commandos. Now, when we do, of course, you do have Gabe Jones begin to speak about the fallen members of the Howling Commandos. Because over the years, there were so many different members of the Howling Commandos, but not all of them got the Infinity Formula. And some of them did die on different kinds of missions over the years and so right now you have gabe jones kind of saying you know what this next drink this next round goes to the lost members of the howling commandos as a way to show respect to the ones they have lost over the years now the reason why we had that opening page for the third chapter be gabe jones showing respect to the different members of the Howling Commandos who had died over the years. And the reason why we had that page is because when we do jump back over to the battle between the Howling Commandos and Hydra, because right now you have Hydra trying to get revenge against the Howling Commandos. Right now you have a huge battle breakout, but Hydra has the upper hand because they were able to get a surprise attack. And with them getting that surprise attack, of course, the helicarriers of Howling Commandos get so damaged, they have no choice but to abandon the helicarriers. Now, when they reach the ground, they're surrounded by even more Hydra agents. And this leads into a very huge moment. And that is why the opening of the third chapter had Gabe Jones kind of showing respect to the lost ones of the Howling Commandos over the years. And the reason why, because with Hydra being able to get that surprise attack on the Howling Commandos, you have more members of the Howling Commandos die. First is Eric, but then at the end of this section, we also see Gabe Jones being killed off by Gorgon. And that right there is a huge loss, because Gabe Jones was one of the best Howling Commandos members, and now he's gone just like that. And so that was a huge loss for the Howling Commandos. And so getting back over to the present day, we actually do pick up right now with Dum Dum Dugan, Jasper, and also the United Nations talking about the idea of what they were trying to accomplish. Like what was their end goal here? Because in reality, they went into China illegally and they almost caused an international incident between America and China. But then that's the moment where you have Dum Dum Dugan say, what we were trying to do was something y'all are not trying to do, which is go after these terrorist groups. Because the problem is though, on your map right now, you have a map that identifies all the different bases of Hydra, all the different bases of Leviathan. And the problem is though, you guys, America, is not trying to do anything at all to stop these countries who are technically housing these terrorists in their countries. That right there is a problem. But on top of that, these countries are using these terrorist groups for their own personal gain. And that is also a problem right there as well. And you're upset with the idea that Nick Fury doesn't want to work with you guys or work for you guys. And that right there really does bother you. And so that ends the actual meeting between Dum Dum Dugan and also the members of the United Nations. Now, that is the moment where we actually pick up with the UN counselor returning to her office. Now, when she does return to her office after the big meeting with Dum Dum Dugan and also Jasper, well, that is the moment she is confronted by Senator Robert Walston. Now, when it comes to Robert Walston, he wants to know what in the world's going on. Like, he wants an update with Dum Dum Dugan and Jasper. And she says right now that technically they're being held in a maximum security prison, but unfortunately, they're in legal limbo because at the same time, they're having a hard time finding a way to actually convict them, but at the same time, they're afraid to let them go because right now their end goal is to hopefully get to Nick Fury. And so right now you have Robert Walson say, I need you to continue to question the commandos to figure out what they are hiding, to figure out what they are plotting to do. We need to figure out more about their whole entire operation, but also what is Nick Fury trying to do down the road? And so to close on today's storyline, we do pick up in the past once again 
at the reunion where you do have Steve Rogers actually coming to Nick Fury. Now, when Steve Rogers do come to Nick Fury, you have Steve Rogers asking Nick Fury, is he over his head with what he is trying to accomplish? Because if he continues down this path, Steve Rogers is not going to stop him, but he wants Nick Fury to know that if you do continue down this path, there is no happy ending. And Nick Fury knows what Steve Rogers means by that. You're going to lose a lot of different things, items, or people close to you to reach a goal that you're trying to reach that may be unreachable. And so this Now, here's the thing about Volume 5. When we actually jump into Volume 5, it has been six months since the ending of Volume 4. And with that happening, Hydra had to move to a new base. And their new base is actually located in Seattle. Now, this is why I say cities across the world are now being affected by this war between the Howling Commandos and, of course, Secret Warriors fighting against Hydra and also Leviathan. Because with Hydra's base right now being in Seattle, of course, it does get attacked. But the problem is though, because whoever attacked this base had a hard time actually pinpointing where the base was actually located at, they attacked all of Seattle, just throwing big, huge boulders or whatever kind of missiles at Seattle as a way to blow up the base of Hydra. And so that is why I said, you now have cities across the world being affected by this war. Now that is the moment where we actually pick up with Nick Fury. Now when we actually do pick up with Nick Fury, is Nick right now kind of giving us an update about how bad this war has truly gotten between all three groups. Because apparently with this war right now taking place across the world, you have a lot of deaths, and not just soldiers, but also innocent people. London has been attacked, Paris has been attacked, Columbia has been attacked, Seattle now has been attacked. And you're talking about the idea that soldiers and innocent people are dying left and right because of this war. Now, there was a moment where a ceasefire was actually reached between Hydra and also Leviathan. The problem was though, one of the leaders of Leviathan was killed off. And because of that, of course, that ceasefire went away just like that. And so the war was back on. And so now this is Nick Fury saying, we have to end this war. And the way we are actually going to end this war is attack this certain location. And so right now, he's showing his team this location that they are going to attack. Now for right now, we have no idea what base they're going to attack and who that base belongs to, but we're going to find out very soon after the next section. And so that is the moment where we do jump over to Hellfire. Now remember, Hellfire is the grandson of the original Ghost Rider, but on top of that, Hellfire is actually a double agent. He's right now secretly working for Hydra. Now that right there is actually very important. And the reason why because it's right now Hellfire sharing over information to Hydra about the plans Nick Fury has with the Secret Warriors. And so right now it's Nick Fury technically being played once again. And the reason why I'm saying he's being played once again because let's not forget. The reason why this series kicked off is because Nick Fury found out that the entire time S.H.I.E.L.D. was up, S.H.I.E.L.D. was being controlled secretly by HYDRA. And so right now, with him kind of leaving S.H.I.E.L.D. behind and believing that his team, the Secret Warriors, was secure, that no one was a double agent, he has no idea that Hellfire is actually a double agent. And matter of fact, you have Hellfire right now kind of second guessing the idea of betraying his team. Because let's not forget, Homeboy fell in love with Daisy Johnson, his team leader. But either way, he has no choice but to share information over to Hydra. Either way, he does tell one of his guys who work for Hydra, what is Nick Fury actually up to next? And apparently, they are going to attack a base known as... Gihanna. 
Now we do kind of find out that Johanna is actually a base that is owned by Hydra. And so that is what Nick Fury meant earlier about ending the war. He's right now trying to take out one of the two enemies, Hydra or Leviathan. And right now, technically Hydra is the weaker target. And so what he tells his team right now is that they are going to attack this base that's being controlled by Hydra. The problem is though, they can't go in the front door and they can't go in the back door either. And so what they're going to do is actually teleport to another secret base that Nick Fury has, but this base is actually out in space. And the reason why they're going to do this is because with this space base, they do have a way to kind of zoom in on the actual base. And the reason why, because Eden is going to teleport everyone into the actual base. Now for him to do that, he has to see where he's actually going. Because when it comes to Manifold, aka Eden, at this point in Marvel Comics, he wasn't that powerful just yet. Now later on, he will become very powerful. But for right now, he's not. And so for him to teleport, he has to see where he is going. And so right now, it's Nick saying, you are going to teleport us into the base so we're able to actually do a surprise attack on Hydra and to hopefully take him out once and for all. But here comes the big problem though, because once they're able to actually teleport inside the base, of course, that is the moment they realize that they are actually surrounded by a bunch of Hydra agents. And of course, Nick Fury is freaking out, but at the same time, he has to realize that they have to fight on. That yes, his surprise attack failed, but right now he has no choice but to keep fighting and to hope to pray that they're still able to actually destroy this base. Now, we also kind of find out that Nick Fury is going to make sure this base is no longer around because what he did was he also planted a bunch of bombs in this base as a way to make sure this base does blow up. The problem is though, when it comes time for them to actually leave by using Eden once again to teleport out of the base, he gets taken out by some Hydra agents. And so their one way out just disappeared just like that. But to make matters worse, right now our heroes were only fighting against the agents of Hydra, the henchmen of Hydra. But that is the moment they are confronted by the bosses of Hydra. And so right now this fight just got very intense. And with Eden being knocked out, technically right now they have no way out. Their goal was to teleport out of here before the bomb blew up. But right now it seems like they might die alongside with the rest of Hydra when the bombs do go off. And so getting into the second chapter of this storyline, we actually do pick up right now with the secret warriors fighting against the forces of Hydra. Now, Nick Fury's plan was not actually to fight against the forces of Hydra. Their main goal was to actually sneak inside the base, set the bombs, get out of the base before the bombs blew up, and that was it. And so right now, Nick Fury's plan is falling apart very quickly. On top of that, now he's kind of like, listen, my original way out of here was Manifold. And with him being knocked out, we no longer can teleport out of here. So we have to find a different way out. Now, that is the moment where you actually do have Phobos, the son of Ares, the god of war, tell Nick Fury, listen, I saw the future, and I know that we are going to get out of this mess. But for us to get out of here, we have to actually take that door right there. And so, of course, you have Nick Fury and the Secret Warriors actually take that exit to get out of there before the bobs go off. Now, as they are actually leaving the place or leaving that certain room, some of the bobs do go off. Now, with the bobs going off, it does technically split the team up. And what I mean by that is there was a walkway, but because the bombs went off, that walkway fell apart. And so on one side of the walkway, you have most of the secret warriors there. On the other side of the walkway, it's Nick Fury right now with Phobos about to be attacked once again by Hydra. And so they have to find a way to actually cross over to the other side. 
Now, this leads into the very sad moment of this book and the first death of this book. And what I mean by that is you do have Nick Fury pull out a tool that can actually help him travel to the other side. And so his goal right now is to grab Phobos and travel to the other side to join up with the rest of the secret warriors. The problem is though, when he begins the process to actually use the tool, you have Phobos force Nick Fury over to the other side, but to leave him behind. And so Phobos is on the wrong side right now and about to fight against the forces of Hydra. Now, Phobos knows that this must happen because he knows what he has to do to give his team the chance to actually escape to get out of there before they're all killed off by Hydra. And so with that being said, right now, you technically have Phobos getting ready to fight against Gorgon. Now, Gorgon is one of the five big bosses of Hydra, but let's not forget, his mutant ability is that if you do look into his eyes, you get turned into stone. And so right now, he's kind of like, listen, even though I have that mutant ability, I'm a great fighter. I'm a great sword fighter, which means that I'm going to fight against Phobos and kill you off. And so it does lead into a battle between Phobos and also Gorgon. Now, this battle is beautiful. Like, at first, I'm kind of like, listen, the entire series, Phobos has been that person where he is very overconfident. Like, he's so confident about his powers and his fighting skills that he's kind of like, okay, there's no way I'm going to lose this battle. But when it comes to this battle right here, you can tell that he knows he is going to lose the battle because he knows what he's doing right now. He's trying to hold off Gorgon and the rest of the forces of Hydra to give his team the chance to actually escape. Because at the end of this fight, Gorgon does kill off Phobos. And so that is the first death in this storyline and a whole lot more to come. And so getting into the third chapter of this storyline, we actually do pick up right now with the Secret Warriors realizing they lost one of their own. This is a huge moment because they can't believe that Phobos is dead. The youngest member on the team is now gone. But either way, they still have to leave if they want to survive. Now, this is where things get a tad bit crazy or begin to get even crazier because you do have Daisy Johnson just let out all of that anger because she was the field leader of the team. And to see Alex Phobos right now dead, she's just full of rage. And so she does cause an earthquake in the building. Either way, it's Nick saying, we have to leave. We have to keep going because right now, if we stay here, we are going to die. And so you do have the team continue to take the path to hopefully get out of this space. The problem is, though, a bunch of Hydra agents just jump right in. And as you know, Nick Fury is cut off from the rest of the group. And so right now, you have Hellfire say, Daisy, get our team out of here. I'll go back, get Nick. But right now, we have to hurry, so go. And so you do have Hellfire go back in to help out Nick to fight against the forces of Hydra. Now, honestly, this is a pretty cool battle because it's Nick Fury and Hellfire working together. And let's not forget, in the earlier parts of this series, Hellfire did not like Nick at all. Like at first, he was kind of like, yeah, I'm down to join your secret warriors team. But after that, Hellfire kind of hated the idea that Nick was not sharing all the information about different missions to Hellfire and the rest of the group. But on top of that, he kind of felt like he was just a tool to be used by Nick Fury, but not realizing that Nick actually cared for every single person in that group. And so right now, you have Hellfire and Nick working together until another bomb goes off. Now, when this other bomb goes off, Hellfire does fall down because technically the ground underneath them just goes away. And so right now, is Hellfire hanging on for his life because Nick was able to grab him. Now, 
Hellfire thinks Nick is going to pull him back up, except that is the moment where we have Nick tell us, the readers, but also Hellfire, that he knows that Hellfire is actually the traitor. Because he said, listen, we were in lockdown earlier when I told you guys what was happening across the world right now with this war between Hydra, Leviathan, and us. But in that lockdown, no one was supposed to leave. But you left. And you met up with that guy earlier. And guys, he did. We saw in the earlier parts of the storyline. Nick was on the outside of the building listening into that conversation. And so because of that, Nick knows that Hellfire is a traitor. And so you have Nick say, listen, I feel like you had no idea how much I cared for you and the rest of the team. You believed I used you like a tool, but in reality, I didn't do that. I was trying to help you guys get better, prepare you guys for the world, but you were a hothead. And let me tell you something else. When I look at Daisy, I look at her as a daughter. And right now, I know you love her, but I have to protect her, but also protect the rest of my team. And so you have Nick let Hellfire go and fall into the abyss of, well, not the abyss, but technically fall to his death. And so we're left to believe that technically right now, Hellfire is dead. And so when Nick is able to actually meet up with the rest of the team right now as they're about to get on a jet to actually escape this hot mess they were in, you have Daisy looking for Hellfire for JT. And you have Nick say, I'm sorry, he's not coming. And so now Daisy has to deal with the idea that now she lost two members, but one of those two was her boyfriend, Hellfire. He is now dead. Now for Daisy, she is very upset. But she has no idea that the guy she loved was actually a traitor. And so Nick must tell her that later on because right now they have to escape and get away from this place before more bombs actually blow up at the moment. But that is the moment where we do jump over to Kraken and also Baron Von Strucker. Now when we do, we do see the two characters right now getting report that technically Nick Fury and the rest of the Secret Warriors were able to escape. Now, I want to mention real quick, I didn't tell you guys how in the world Nick Fury and the rest of the Secret Warriors were able to escape by finding some random jet because that actually right there leads into a later point in the storyline where the random jet came from. Either way, you have Baron Von Strucker and Kraken, the two bosses of Hydra right now, very upset about the idea that technically Nick Fury and the rest of the Secret Warriors were able to get away. And so that is the moment where you have Kraken actually begin to beat down on Baron Von Strucker. Because we have to remember, this is not the original Kraken. The original Kraken died a couple years ago. It's someone right now pretending to be Kraken. And we still have no idea who this character is. But right now, he's beating down on Baron Von Strucker to technically say, it's time for you to pay for your sins. Now, that is the moment where we actually do pick up with Phobos. And when we do, it's Phobos right now in the afterlife for dead gods. Now, with that being said, he's actually able to meet up with his father, Ares, the god of war. Where right now, you have Ares, the god of war, kind of wondering how his son died to be able to come to the afterlife for gods. But either way, it's a way for Phobos and Ares, the god of war, to spend time with one another. But of course, these two characters are going to come back to life sooner or later down the road. Because when it comes to gods, they always die, but they always come back to life again down the road. And so right now, it's just a father and son being able to actually spend time with one another once again. Now, that is the moment where we do jump over to Sebastian Drood. Now, remember, Sebastian Drood was actually part of the Secret Warriors, but he was actually kicked off the team because the Nick Fury, he felt like when it came to Drood, he wasn't a great fit for the team. That sooner or later, Drood was going to get a bunch of innocent people killed 
or possibly a team member. And so when we jump into the fourth chapter, we do jump back in time where you have Drew finding that note in his room saying that, hey man, listen, you're off the team now. Get the heck out of here and go back home. And so of course, Drew did go back home. He went back home to Hawaii. Except when he does walk into his house, well, that is the moment where he's actually confronted by John Garrett. Now, John Garrett is actually a character we saw in the earlier books of our coverage over Secret Warriors. But on top of that, he does work for Nick Fury, but most of his body is just cybernetics. It's just robot parts. Either way, the reason why John Gary is here right now is to actually train Sebastian Drood. And this is why. Because Nick Fury did kick him off the team. And the reason why? Because Nick felt like Drood had huge potential. But to actually reach that potential, he had to be trained properly. And so for the next few months, it's right now Drood being trained by, of course, John Garrett to make him a better magic user, to make him a better druid. But on top of that, to have him be a better fit for the team now, because now he's being trained by someone who is a great trainer. And so after Sebastian was trained by John Garrett, you didn't have Sebastian and John go on different missions for Nick Fury. Now, these missions were very crucial, but the very last one we're gonna talk about is the one that actually ties back into what Nick Fury told us at the very beginning of this video. Because Nick told us at the very beginning of this video that there was a moment in the six month period between volume five and volume four where Hydra and also Leviathan called for a ceasefire. Now that ceasefire did went on to last for a couple weeks until one of the bosses of Leviathan was killed off. Now, Leviathan believes that it was actually Hydra, but in reality, it wasn't Hydra. It was actually Sebastian and John right now out there setting up Hydra to make it seem like Hydra said, you know what, ignore that ceasefire and continue to attack Leviathan. But in reality, it was Sebastian Shaw and Drood. Now, with that being said, these two characters did a lot of different things, but these two characters are being brought up right now for another reason. And that other reason is what I said earlier. Because remember, the Secret Warriors were able to escape when they came to fighting against Hydra, but they found a random jet. Well, that jet was not found by them. That jet was brought to them by Sebastian and John because they were the backup plan just in case Nick said, you know what? If Eden cannot teleport us out of here, I need a backup plan. And his backup plan was, of course, Sebastian and also John coming in. Now, the rest of the Secret Warriors can't believe to see him again. Because, one, he's in better shape. But on top of that, he is a better magic user. And so, either way, the Secret Warriors were able to escape thanks to John and also Sebastian coming in with their own jet to get the team out of there. Now, once the team is able to actually get back to their base, well, that is the moment where it does seem like everything is about to end with this storyline, or the team is about to be broken up. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when you do have the team arrive back at the base, you have Nick inform Daisy that the guy she lost, Hellfire, the one who technically fell to his death, well, this is the moment where she comes to find out the man that she was so madly in love with was actually a traitor. And when she finds this out, she can't believe that she got so close to someone who was actually a traitor, someone she actually cared for. Now, that is the moment where you actually have John kind of mention something else to Sebastian in a way of saying that when it comes to this particular team, the secret warriors, they're about to get shut down. Because let's not forget, Nick Fury has other teams out there and all the teams had the same name, Caterpillar teams. Either way, there are three of them out there and Daisy's team, the secret warriors, is just one of them. But right now, it's John saying, your team is technically right now off the board. 
you are no longer a team. I'm sorry, but it seems like you guys are about to go back home and enjoy your regular lives once again. Now, when we get into the final chapter of the storyline, we actually do pick up with Nick Fury right now, looking over two graves. Now, we have no idea who these two graves belong to, but it seems like it is very recent. And so right now, it's Nick Fury kind of upset about the idea that he lost two people. Now, it could be Phobos, because he did die just in an earlier chapter. But the question is though, who does the other grave belong to? Because it could be Hellfire as well, but Nick Fury did not like Hellfire because Hellfire was a traitor. And so that is the moment where we do jump back one year in the past. Now, when we do, we pick up with Nick Fury right now, meeting up with his son, Mikel Fury. Now, this is actually very important because we know Mikel Fury is going to lead in the present day, one of the three Caterpillar teams out there. And remember, Caterpillar teams are just small teams that Nick Fury have put together to technically do different kind of black on missions around the world. The secret warriors that are being led by Daisy Johnson, they're just one Caterpillar team. Either way, we know Mikel Fury does lead one of those teams. And so this whole chapter right here is telling us how Nick was able to bring in his son and then you have Mikel Fury go around the world to find other people to bring into this organization to his Caterpillar team. Now, I could sit here right now and explain every single character on Mikel Fury's Caterpillar team, but I'm not going to. And the reason why, because these characters are cool in some kind of way, but they only appear like a handful of time in Marvel Comics down the road after this storyline. And so unfortunately, I'm not going to sit here and be like, okay, so here's this guy and their powers and this girl and his powers. Instead, I'll be like, listen, he went to different locations around the world. He found different people that Nick Fury believed would be a best fit for his Caterpillar team. And then bam. Mikel Fury had his own team, and now they can begin the process of actually working for Nick Fury. And we already know what their main goal is to do, to help Nick Fury take down Hydra, later on take down Leviathan. Now once Mikel was able to recruit all these different characters to his team, they began the process of actually helping Nick Fury fight against Hydra and Leviathan by attacking different bases across the world. Now, with that being said, they were very successful at first, but then you have Mikel Fury and his team get ambushed at one particular base. And because of that ambush, most of their team was killed off. And so Mikel realized he had no way out, that he was going to die there. But he knew that before he dies, he has to hit the trigger button. That of course is going to set off the bomb to blow up the base that he was attacking. And so right now, this section right here, it takes place two days prior from the present day, which means that now we know at least one of the graves belongs to Mikel Fury in the present day with Nick Fury at the grave site. Because you do have Mikel hit the button, the bomb blows off, and of course the base goes bye-bye, but unfortunately, Mikel Fury is also dead as well. And his final words were, Dad, I did my best. And that was the last time Nick Fury hurt his son ever again. And so when we get back to the present day with Nick Fury, we do get confirmation that technically at the moment, he is at his son's grave, Mikel Fury. But at the same time, there are other graves there as well. It's Mikel's team. They all died and they all were buried in the same place in this graveyard. And so right now, it's Nick Fury feeling sad because these young people believed in him. They believed in him so much, but unfortunately, he led them to their death. And now his own son is gone as well. Now, this is present day. So this is actually very important. And the reason why, because that is the moment where you do have Nick Fury get surrounded by a bunch of Hydra agents who are right now being led by Kraken. And you have Kraken say, you know what, it's over. And to Nick, he's like, yeah, it's over. And so it seems like Hydra was able to finally capture Nick Fury. And it seems like this is going to be the end of Nick Fury. But this is where we are going to end today. 
And so in the opening pages of this book, we actually do pick up in the year 1961. And we're going to learn a whole lot more about the Howling Commandos and Nick Fury, but also Hydra and Leviathan as well. And really more of Leviathan because they were technically a new group that popped up recently in this series. Either way though, when we actually pick up with Jake Fury, he's right now being brought to a secret base. Now he has no idea where this base is actually at. And the reason why, because he was blindfolded. Either way though, once he does arrive at the entrance of the base, you then have the guard of the base say, please say your name. Now this is Jake Fury thinking, okay, you are my name and what I do. So my name is Jake Fury and I am, but right before he's able to actually explain what he does, he's actually cut off by the guard. And the guard says, no, use your actual code name for this meeting. And you have Jake Fury say, fine, Fury, AKA Scorpio. And so because of that, he was able to open up the entrance and go inside this secret base. And so that is the moment where you do have Jake Fury go inside the secret base. Now, when he does go inside the secret base, that is the moment where he's actually in a special meeting. And this right here is giving us our first look of a brand new group called the Great Will of Zodiac. Now, with that being said, though, the Great Will of Zodiac is going to explain everything that has been happening in the entire run of Secret Warriors. This is Jonathan Hickman wrapping everything up with a nice little bow. And so with that being said, when it comes to the Great Will of Zodiac, this new group is basically a bunch of men from different groups in Marvel Comics coming together because one particular guy called for this meeting. And we come to find out that you do have people from S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Howling Commandos at this point in time. And that would be Jay Fury, Nick Fury, John Garrett, Cornelius Van Lunt, Dum Dum Dugan, Thomas Davison. Now, here's the thing though. You also have leaders from HYDRA as well. And that would be Baron Von Strucker and Daniel Whitehall. You also have leaders from Leviathan as well. So, of course, the Magadan and also Orion. But you also have a leader from the hand there as well. Now, the hand leader is actually brand new. This is his first appearance, and that will be Shoji Soma. Either way, all these guys came together because one particular guy called for this meeting, and that will be Leonardo da Vinci. Now, here's the thing though. He does not tell them or us that technically that is his name, but honestly, it is him. But either way, he says everybody here has a code name and your code name is actually a Zodiac sign. With that being said, the reason why I called you guys here is to help you guys, but to also have you guys help me because I feel like we can help each other. I'm trying to achieve something great here, but at the same time, so are you guys. You guys are trying to win a war, a secret war, a spy war. I can help you guys win your war. But here's the thing though, you have to help me first. But here's, a, here's one rule, you are not allowed to take any kind of notes about our meetings inside this place at all. And so if I see a pen and paper, I'm going to be very upset and replace you with someone else. Either way, are you guys down to actually help me win my objective so that I can help you guys win your objectives as well? And of course you have every single person in the room say yes. Now the reason why they're saying yes because they are very intrigued on how Leonardo da Vinci is gonna help them win their spy war. And so after the meeting, you then have Leonardo da Vinci break the group up into three different teams. And they all went on different missions across the world to collect different items that can actually help out Leonardo da Vinci. But once all the items are here, and then they're able to actually bring those items together to help him complete his objective, then on top of that, he'll help them with their spy war. And so we do see one team actually go over to Egypt. Now, the reason why they go over to Egypt is because there was a spaceship that had crashed there a long time ago. And that spaceship belongs to the alien race known as the Brood. 
Now, the Brood is an old Marvel comic thing. And when it comes to the Brood, they are technically this bug alien race that goes around and tries to conquer different planets in the most messed up way. Now, honestly, I would love to dive deeper into them more, but right now we have to continue on. Either way, we come to find out on the Brew spaceship, there is some kind of power source that Leonardo da Vinci wants from that spaceship. And so, of course, Team One went over to Egypt to find that spaceship to find the power source, which they do. Unfortunately, they do run into an army of the Brood. And so now they have to fight their way out of there and bring that power source back over to Leonardo da Vinci. Now, team number two was actually sent over to a chapel in France. And the reason why, because in that chapel, there is another special item there. Now, technically, we are not told what this item is just yet. As a matter of fact, we learn about the item down the road. Either way, though, you do have the team arrive at the chapel. And of course, you do have the nuns very upset about the idea that there are guys just walking in with guns like it's no big deal. Either way, they do go into the underground area of the church, and when they do, they find this coffin. Now, when they open up the coffin, of course, they do find the particular item that Leonardo wanted, but the problem is, though, out of nowhere, a bunch of tentacles just come out of nowhere and begin to grab Jay Fury and attack his group as well. Now, the third team went over to the Zargos Mountains, and the reason why, because there was a secret base that was being guarded by a bunch of robots. Now, when the team arrives at this base, of course, they break in and we kind of find out what did Leonardo da Vinci wanted from this particular base. And right now we see that there are a bunch of containers just there. Now, we saw these containers, matter of fact, in the earlier stories of Secret Warriors. And we have to remember, those containers were basically used by Leviathan as a way to keep their warriors in stasis for a long period of time until the right time to come out of stasis. And so now the question is, how did Leviathan get their hands on the containers? Did they double cross the great will of Zodiac? Either way, their mission is accomplished and they bring the containers back over to Leonardo da Vinci. And so once you have all the three teams come back together at the meeting spot for the great will of Zodiac, well, that is the moment we kind of find out that each group was able to bring back the item that they were sent out there to retrieve, except Jake Fury's group. And this right here is going to begin the process of portrayals in the great will of Zodiac. And what I mean by that is you have team one say, hey, we found the power source of the Brew spaceship. Team 3 says, hey, we found the containers that you were looking for. But when it comes to Team 2, Jake Fury's team, they're all like, hey, we didn't find anything at all. Now, that right there is not true because we saw them. When they had opened up the coffin, something attacked them. And of course, they had survived that attack to be here right now. But the question is, though, what did they find? And matter of fact, Leonardo da Vinci knows that Jake Fury is basically lying about saying we didn't find anything at all. And so this leads into Leviathan beginning the process of actually portraying the great will of Zodiac. And the reason why I'm saying that because once you have everybody figure out what Leonardo was trying to do with the containers, but also the power source of the Brew spaceship, we come to find out that he was trying to create his own super soldiers. So let me explain. Originally, the containers could keep someone in stasis and they could stay frozen in time for however long until they're actually woken up. But here's the catch though. If those containers are basically hooked up to the power source of the Brew spaceship, it could then actually change them while being inside the containers. And so imagine this, if you're inside a container, you're right now on stasis, but you're also being turned into a super soldier. And so that was it seems like when it comes to Leonardo da Vinci, what he wanted to do to create an army of super soldiers. But here's the problem, though. Leviathan betrays the group. And so this moment right here explains how Leviathan was able to get their hands on the containers, but also the power source that belongs to the brood. And so because of that, they began to attack the rest of the Great Will of Zodiac and being able to escape with the containers as well. 
but this is also the moment we see that Nick Fury gets his eye shot, which explains why he only has one eye, because of this fight right here. And so with that being said, Leviathan had betrayed the great will of Zodiac and got away with the containers, but also the power source that came from the brood spaceship. Now, one month later, we come to find out that Hydra in the hand actually joined forces. Baron Von Strucker actually teamed up with Grandmaster Soma. And the reason why? To get revenge against Leviathan for basically betraying the group. Now, of course, they do find the base that belongs to Leviathan. And when they do find the base of Leviathan, you had Hydra in the hand attack the base. Now, it did lead into a very huge battle. But here comes the big problem though, and not really a problem for Hydra nor the Hand, but the problem for Leviathan. And the reason why, because Orion, the leader of Leviathan, he does get stabbed by Baron Von Strucker. Now right after he was stabbed, you didn't have the Magadan try to put Orion inside the machine to basically heal him up in one of the containers. The problem was though, when he did that, you had Grandmaster Soma take the power source that came from the brew spaceship away from the containers. And so instead of actually getting healed up and becoming a super soldier, the containers began to feed on themselves, basically turning Orion into something different, not into an actual super soldier. And so he was technically not saved at that moment. But with that being said though, you didn't have Hydra in the hand leave the base after being able to take out the leader of Leviathan. Now we then jump back over to Nick Fury. Now when we do, we see Nick Fury right now meeting up with Leonardo da Vinci to basically say what you did was wrong. You conned us all here was a huge mistake because technically now you had unleashed two powerful organizations out there, Hydra and also, of course, Leviathan. And we have no idea what they're going to do down the road to the rest of the world. But thanks to you, you have technically ticked off the two powerful leaders and could lead them down the road to do more horrible things to the entire world. Good job, man. Now, when it comes to Leonardo da Vinci, he says, this is actually not over. And then the meeting ends on that note right there. But then we jump to the present day. And matter of fact, we pick up where our last video left off at, where you have Nick Fury get captured by Hydra. Now, once he's brought inside this room, we come to find out that he's being held hostage alongside with Baron Von Strucker. Now, that right there is huge because Baron Von Strucker was technically, before the storyline, still the leader of Hydra are one of the five leaders of Hydra. Either way right now, we come to find out they're being held hostage by Kraken. Now remember, the Kraken right now is not the old school Kraken. The old school got killed off, and we have no idea who is this new Kraken who's right now pretending to be the old one, because Baron Von Strucker still believes that this right here is his old friend, not knowing it's not his old friend at all. But right now, it seems like this Kraken is about to kill off Nick Fury and also Baron Von Strucker. And so when we jump into the second chapter of the storyline, we actually do pick up right now with Baron Von Strucker and Nick Fury being left alone in this room. Now, the reason why they're being left alone, because this is technically Kraken saying, I want you two guys to technically talk it out. I want you guys to come to peace with one another because when I come back in this room, I'm going to kill you both. So hopefully you guys can actually have one last civil conversation. Now, once Kraken leaves the room, that is the moment you have Baron Von Strucker say, hey, Nick, let's work together. Now, of course, Nick says no. And the reason why he says no, because it's Nick saying, I want to die. Now, the reason why Nick Fury wants to die, because he lost his son. In the last video, he also lost Phobos, the son to Ares, the god of war. He wants to go ahead and give up. He lost a lot of people. And so right now, it's technically him saying, hey man, listen, we're not going to work together. Matter of fact, we are going to die together because I have come to peace with the idea that dying is okay because I deserve to die because I led a lot of men to their deaths, including my own son. 
Now, once you have Kraken walk back into the room, of course, that is the moment you have Baron Von Strucker want to know why in the world did Kraken do this? Like, why in the world is he portraying Hydra? And why in the world is he portraying his dear old friend, Baron Von Strucker? Because Baron Von Strucker doesn't realize that this is not his old friend, Kraken. This is someone else right now pretending to be Kraken. Now, that is the moment where we actually do learn more about the box. Now, remember, the box was this special box we saw in the earlier parts of Secret Warriors. Now, at first, we had no idea what was so special about the box. But then later on, we learned that the box was actually containing the power source that came from the Brood alien ship. Of course, that is why Leviathan wanted the box so badly in the earlier parts of Secret Warriors, because with that power source, they'll be able to actually bring back their fellow soldiers out of stasis in those containers. And so that's why they've been going around the world looking for the box, looking for the power source. Now in this flashback, we actually do see Grandmaster Soma, of course, the leader of the hand, meaning up with Lord Shingen and also Silver Samurai. Now remember, Silver Samurai was actually protecting the box in the earlier parts of this series. But of course, he gave the box over to Hydra. And the reason why, because they were trying to keep the box away from Leviathan. Of course, Leviathan got the box and of course being able to wake up their fellow soldiers. But in this flashback though, is Soma saying, listen, every single time the box is opened up, Leviathan is able to find it. And of course, they come after it and try to retrieve it. And of course, the person who had opened up the box ends up dead. And the reason why, because as soon as the box is opened up, when it comes to Leviathan, they're able to trace the energy that comes from the power source to a location. And so in Hanasoma, he had opened up the box. And so, of course, Leviathan came to where he was at and killed him off. But right before they did that, he was able to pass the box off to Silver Samurai, which now explains how in the world he was able to get his hands on the box. But when we get back to the present day, right now you have Baron Von Strucker still trying to figure out why in the world is Kraken right now portraying Hydra, or technically portraying Baron Von Strucker. Because right now to Baron Von Strucker, it seems like Kraken just wants to kill off him and Nick Fury so that Hydra would be all his. But at the same time, with Nick Fury being dead, the main problem for Hydra will be gone as well. Not knowing that really, when it comes to Kraken, this is not his Kraken. This is someone else right now pretending to be the old Kraken. Now that is the moment we come to find out that this Kraken is actually working with Nick Fury because you have this Kraken cut Nick Fury loose. Now when it comes to Baron Von Strucker, that is the moment he realized, oh my God, you're not my friend. You're not the old school Kraken. You're someone else. Who in the world are you? And that is the moment you have the reveal of this crack we've been seeing in the entire series. And we come to find out it is Jacob Fury, the brother to Nick Fury. This entire time we have been seeing him, he has been pretending to be Kraken as a way to kind of help Nick Fury bring down Hydra. Now, when it comes to Baron Von Strucker, he cannot believe that what he is seeing right now, because technically right now, he is seeing Jacob Fury, who should be dead right now, which honestly is correct, because when it came to Jacob Fury, he killed himself. And so because of that, it's kind of like, why in the world is he here right now? How in the world is he here right now? He should be dead. And that is the moment you have Nick say, no, you did watch my brother die. But that was not actually my brother. That was actually a life model decoy that you watched die. And so then you have Nick tell Baron Von Strucker, think back to the days of the Great Will of Zodiac, where we had to go on different missions. The other two teams came back with their objectives. We did not. We told you guys we didn't find anything. But that right there was actually false. What we found was the first prototype of the life model decoy and that day the life model decoy actually took form of my brother jacob and so the entire time 
you were watching the life model decoy, not my real brother. And so ever since that day, we got better in building life model decoys. Either way though, the person you see right now, yeah, that is my real brother. The one you saw die years ago, yeah, that was the life model decoy. But then we come to find out there was one other person who was also a life model decoy that was used as a way to trick Baron Von Strucker. Because we come to find out Thomas Davison was actually a life model decoy. So let me explain. Thomas Davison is actually the guy who had apparently portrayed S.H.I.E.L.D. and joined HYDRA and then created a system that HYDRA could use to control S.H.I.E.L.D. But in reality, that system was not actually made to help HYDRA control S.H.I.E.L.D. It was the other way around. It was a system to help S.H.I.E.L.D. control HYDRA. And when it came to Thomas Davison, it was a life model decoy that was technically working for Nick. And so in reality, in this entire run, in this entire series, Hydra has been actually working for S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. has been controlling Hydra. Nick Fury has been controlling Hydra. It's not the other way around. And so right now, it's Baron Von Strucker realizing, oh my gosh, I've been, I've been played this entire time. And so when we jump into the third chapter of this storyline, it does lead into Nick Fury saying, you know what, because you now know everything, it's about time for you to basically die. And so I'm going to kill you off. Now, when it comes to Baron Von Strucker, he's kind of like, you know what, even though you were able to play me, at least I will know that I was able to actually take away things away from you. Talking about his son and also other soldiers that Baron Von Strucker had killed off. Now that is the moment you have Nick say no. Actually, you did not take anything from me at all. I took things from myself. I let things go on for too long. And so because of that, my son is now dead. His entire team is now dead. All because of me. And so no, in reality, Baron Von Strucker, you did nothing to me at all. It was just myself and my stupidity that led to the death of my son. And so that is the moment you have Baron Von Strucker get shot in the head by Nick Fury. And so technically right now, he is actually dead. But then we pick up with Leviathan. And when we do pick up with Leviathan, it's right now them saying, we should go ahead and attack the last few bases or the last few leaders of Hydra and finally get rid of them. The problem is though, while they're getting ready for their next attack, that is the moment they begin to watch all their different soldiers just explode left and right. And so of course that means something has happened to them once they were able to wake up from the containers and now whatever happened to them is actually taking effect. And of course, killing them off one by one. And of course, when it comes to the leaders of Leviathan, they know it has to do with Nick Fury. But then we jump over to the United Nations Security Council. Now, when we do, we see them right now talking about the idea of helping other countries that were actually affected by the war between Hydra and Leviathan, which honestly is a great thing. But here's the thing though, when it comes to the United States, they're kind of like, listen, we're down to help out. And matter of fact, we had already put some money into this project, but we want to be the ones who actually look over this project to make sure it actually runs correctly. And matter of fact, when it comes to the US president, he had already selected the person to be in charge of this project. And of course, that will be Senator Waston. Now, Senator Waston is actually a founding member of the Howling Commandos. And so that shows you right there that Nick Fury is still playing games right now. He's putting guys in different positions to kind of help him technically make sure the world is safe. And so when it comes to Senator Waston, he right now is going to be the one to run this project to make sure it does run correctly and smaller countries are actually helped out. But then we jump over to Berlin. 
Now the reason why because we actually do pick up right now with Contessa. Now remember, Contessa was actually an old lover of Nick Fury, but at the same time though, we come to find out that she was actually secretly working for Hydra, but at the same time working for Leviathan. She was a triple agent, y'all. So at first, it's Nick saying, yeah, she's on my side. She's part of S.H.I.E.L.D. Nope, she's actually with Hydra. Nope, she's actually with Leviathan. Either way, right now, in Berlin, she does walk into a federal agent office. And when she does, of course, this is her right now saying, I'm turning myself in because I realize we have lost. And there's no point of running or trying to hide from you guys and Nick Fury. But then we jump over to Daisy Johnson, who's right now in Hawaii. Now remember, Daisy Johnson is the field leader for the Secret Warriors. But let's not forget, this entire story so far, we have not seen them at all. This has been a heavily focused Nick Fury story. Either way though, it's right now Jacob Fury finding Daisy and handing her a letter. And he's all like, listen, I have no idea what Nick said in that letter, but I was told to give the letter over to you, so here I am. But right before you have Jacob Fury leave, you have Jacob tell Daisy that Nick told him that she was the best person that he had ever trained, meaning that he really does care a lot for Daisy Johnson. But then we come to find out that Daisy Johnson is actually not alone. That matter of fact, she's with Sebastian. And Sebastian is another member of the Secret Warriors. Either way, that is the moment where you do have the two characters looking at the news. And with them watching the news, of course, you have the news announce the new program that was technically started by the UN Security Council. And this new program right now being led by Waston, of course, the one of the members of the Howling Commandos who works for Nick Fury. And of course, when you have Sebastian and Daisy see this, they're like, oh my gosh, this is actually real. But then she reads the letter that was given to her by Jacob Fury that was written by Nick Fury. And right after she reads the letter, she's kind of like, hey, pack your bags. We have to go on a trip. Now at this moment right now, we have no idea what was said in that letter. But of course, we'll find out in the next chapter. And so that is the moment where we actually jump into the final chapter of this storyline. Now, when we do, we actually do pick up right now with Nick Fury meeting up with Contessa in the interrogation room. Now, of course, remember, these two characters used to be lovers. And he was so hurt when she technically betrayed him, but also realized that she was a triple agent. Now, with that being said, this is the moment where we kind of find out what exactly happened to the soldiers of Leviathan. Because remember, earlier, they just blew up. And when it comes to Contessa and also Orion, they believe that technically they blew up because of something Nick Fury did. And they're right, it was Nick Fury's doing. And matter of fact, you have Nick Fury say, yeah, it was me. Remember the box, you know, the box where you guys were looking for the power source that came from the alien ship, the Brood. Well, let me tell you right now, what you guys got was technically something else. And with that power source I gave you guys, it fed your guys too much energy. And so yes, it was able to wake them up and bring them out of their containers. But the problem was though, is that they were fed so much energy that sooner or later, their lifespan just burned out. And of course, they died. And so with that being said though, it's Nick saying, yeah, I fed your guys technically poison. I gave them more energy, but that energy gave them a shorter lifespan. And so that is how I was able to actually defeat Leviathan and get rid of you guys once and for all. And so for Contessa, it's like, dang, I lost to Nick Fury. Like he is the best spy in the world. And he's right now showing why he is the best spy in the world. And so that is the moment where we do jump over to Dum Dum Dugan and also Jasper Sitwell. And with that being said, we kind of find out that Dum Dum Dugan and Jasper Sitwell have been released from prison. Now this is great because remember, they were technically locked up because they helped out the Holland Commandos and Nick Fury 
take down one of the Hydra bases that was in China. And of course, because they had invaded a country illegally, they had to get locked up. But now they're being released because Hydra is no longer around. Neither is Leviathan. And so with all these different things happening, of course, everything is going great for Nick Fury and company. Now, that is the moment where we actually do learn what was in the letter that was written by Nick Fury, but given over to Quake, a.k.a. Daisy Johnson. And honestly, it's just Fury saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I treated you, but also the rest of the team, but especially you, because I looked at you as a daughter and I feel like I let you down. Even though this mission was successful, I feel like I let you down and I really wish I can reset time and do this all over again and treat you the way I wanted to treat you as a daughter. And so it's Nick Fury apologizing, but he does tell her, I wish for you and the rest of the Secret Warriors to actually reunite and become a superhero team again, except this time, I want you to work with the Howling Commandos and go out there and do great things for the world. But please, please, ask the heroes one more time to come together and be a team once again to save the world, because I feel like you guys are ready to save the world. And so that was what's in Nick Fury's letter. And so then this leads into Steve Rogers meeting up with Nick Fury. Now, when they do meet up, this is Steve Rogers kind of upset with Nick Fury, but at the same time kind of proud of Nick Fury. And what I mean by that is, is Steve Rogers saying, look at what you did. Look at what you accomplished. It's great and all, but at the same time, though, you did too much. This could have been handled so differently, so much better. Unfortunately, you did not do those things, but I'm happy to see that you are alive and well and that you were able to actually accomplish this mission. But it's also Steve Rogers saying, you will never do this again, because if I find out you're doing all these things behind my back again, I'll make sure to stop you and make sure you do things the correct way. And either way, is Nick agreeing with Steve Rogers and the two characters just getting along and enjoying this moment together? Now, the last page does tell us that even though when it comes to Contessa being a triple agent, Nick Fury still cares for her a lot. And so because of that, we do see at the end of the book, Nick Fury is plotting to actually help Contessa break out of prison to be once again a free woman. And so we do see him smile and we already know he has some master plan to actually free her. But this is where we are going to end today's comic book video. So please leave me a like down below and subscribe. Also, if you have any suggestions on books I should read, well, please let me know in the comments below because you never know your suggestion could be a future video down the road. But guys, I'll see you all next time. Later.